Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. In this episode, I'll be sitting down with something a bit different. I don't normally talk about video games, but I'm going to be talking about video games. Specifically, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, the sequel to Je uh, Jedi Fallen Order with uh, Matt Hudson. We're going to be talking about you know, the game's mechanics, story, character arcs, and what makes it worthy of discussion a year after release. You can play Star Wars Jedi Survivor on PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox Series S and X, Xbox One and PC. I don't think I missed a platform on that, but feel free to uh, correct me uh, on, on that. But Matt, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on, Austin. I'm excited to be talking about this game. I'm looking forward to talking about someone who I know loves films so much, but now we're going to be talking about video games. So let's see how that goes. It is something I had to entirely rework my show notes that I normally make. So yeah, it, it, it's it's going to be a bit more in depth. So for listeners or watchers at home, if you're not ready for a two hour, three hour podcast, set aside a block of time. But Matt, since I haven't had you on before, I would love to let people know about what I watched tonight, your outlet and what you've been working on recently. Well, the outlet began in 2016 because, like a lot of people, I just didn't have anyone within my circles to talk film about. Getting into it, having fun talking about film, but more so than did you like the film. I didn't have anyone to sit down and chat with, so I thought I'd create a site where I could review films and provide my own opinions and hopefully find like-minded people who would firstly read them, but secondly also just to converse with. And I have been very lucky to have found a lot of great people along the way since starting the site over eight years ago now, which is wild to comprehend for me. In 2018, I became a Rotten Tomatoes approved critic, and I still am now, yes. which I'm very, very pleased about. It's not something I take lightly, considering all of the discourse that surrounds that red tomato or that green splat. I host a couple of great film podcasts, which allow me to enjoy what I love doing, which is talking about films. The weekly, talking about the new releases in films, or I could be talking about Star Wars, which is pretty good for today's discussion, or horror yeah. films. I, I cover a few gamuts there. Over to your left, you've got a Force Awakens poster. I tell you something right now, right next to me, just happen to have these. I have the Cal Kestis lightsaber, and I have the Seer Junda lightsaber as well. Shot. Yeah, okay, man. Wow. They, they usually sit on my shelf over there alongside the Art of Jedi Survivor, the Art of Fallen Order. I have a custom 3D printed Mantis, which my dad, who does models, he painted beautifully for me. I have a Grease Dritus trading card, which the actor sent me. I've got vintage collection figures up there of the Fallen Order and Survivor gang. It's, I'm obsessed, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was listening to that and I was thinking, dang, I thought I was a Star Wars fan. Apparently not. <laughs> but... I think the most extreme I got was I specifically bought the Star Wars Force Awakens Blu-ray twice. Because for the, those listening at, at the, this moment, the Blu-ray for Force Awakens came out twice. It came out first in Blu-ray, and then a few months later, they released a special 3D Blu-ray where it had this really cool, I guess it was a lenticular color cover of just like Ray's hand and the blue lightsaber, Anakin's lightsaber. You could move it and it looked like it was in motion. I bought that Target Blu-ray, which was just cardboard. It was made out of cardboard. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. And I ended up selling it uh, months later. Um, I think I traded it in somewhere because I was like, I can't look at this on my shelf. This is <laughs> awful looking. But I loved it because it had all the faces of the cast inside. But I thought it was going to be made out of higher quality, but apparently not. Star Wars collecting isn't cheap. And I, is I'm, I can say I'm not a collector. I only collect things like these lightsabers because I can, if I'm going to display them, I, I want things that if somebody's going to come around, they can look at them and be like, oh, that's cool. Everyone's going to say, can I hold the lightsaber? Whereas if I have lots of figures out, it becomes a nightmare to clean. It can look a bit messy and... I don't want to explain all of them to everyone. I'm happy to just explain why I have this lightsaber and be done with it. When Force Awakens came out, I bought all the Wave 1 action figures for that. And I lined my work desk with them. The TIE Fighters, Kylo Ren, the Stormtroopers. I think there are a few other things. I know there's an X-Wing in there or something like that. 
I don't know if Gwendolyn Christie's character was in there. Captain Phasma. Phasma. Yeah. Simpler, weren't they? Yeah, but I bought all those and I don't even want to think about what that bill was. I think it was the price of a PS4, PS5 Pro. Um, Ooh, let's not get into that as well. Ooh. Let's not get into that. No. But we could record a two hour podcast just on that. It's crazy. PS5 and Xbox Series X were current. I kind of feel like the PS Pro, PS5 Pro, the PS6, I imagine, will be out within or by the end of this decade. So why do we need another console in between? Other than money, the ability to upscale should be available for what we have now or or wait until you release the PS6 or whatever. Use that for the next gen. I'm not the most versed on technical stuff, but I looked at that and thought, it's cynical. I won't be purchasing it. I'm happy with my PS5 as it is. Yeah, I got mine, the Spider-Man 2 bundle. I think last December or something like that. I'm good. I, I don't, yeah. 45, 45% better graphics. If I can't tell a difference in a YouTube compression video, I'm not going to be able to tell a difference on my 1080p TV. Yeah, that's it. I um, don't know how many games will be affected by it. If I'm going to play PS4 games, I don't know. This might be my naivety, but I don't know how much better they're going to look on a PS5 Pro if I'm playing older games. It, I don't know how many games it really affects other than the AAA Nuno releases, of which I don't really play any anyway. Yeah, I'm, how much better is Batman Return to Ark? <laughs> I was just playing that last night. But before we get into the main meat of the podcast, I usually ask, what do you want to recommend? In fact, I will customize this recommendation since we're talking about Star Wars. What Star Wars thing would you recommend? It's hard to look past Andor. And I know a lot of people may roll their eyes at that because especially people who listen to me talk Star Wars. I love Andor. But it doesn't always feel like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. To me, though, that is to its benefit there's enough star wars in us in there but if you just want a good character study or a good ensemble cast who are thrown into different arcs and have to find their way out of it all leading towards what we know and or and his conclusion lead to then it's hard to look past that if you ask me other than that what we're going to speak about tonight is also something i would happily recommend I also understand that video games aren't the easiest to just pick up and get into. However, yeah. on YouTube, you can watch game movies. If you've got three and a half, four hours or maybe longer, sit down and watch the Survivor and Fallen Order game movies. That would be the first one I'd go for. Mando season one, because it's beautiful. I'm trying to think outside the box rather than just saying, go and watch Empire Strikes Back or something like that. But go watch Rogue One. Yeah. That was going to be my film recommendation because Rogue One was the first Star Wars movie that I saw multiple times in theaters. I saw maybe Force Awakens twice in theaters. Mm. I think I saw Rogue One three or four, or maybe even five times for the same reasons Andor didn't feel like a Star Wars TV show. It felt like something new. It felt like a guerrilla war movie. But if I'm going to go with a game, I'm going to be the populist choice. I'm going to go Star Wars Rebel Assault. Ooh, okay. Why is that? Why that one? Well, I've got a little bias because it was one of the first Star Wars games I played. Um, but I think it's the only Star Wars game or anything Star Wars that really nailed the feeling of uh, being in the movies. Um, I would play that trench run Um level so many times <laughs> i probably played that more times than the actual campaign itself because it was just so fun to run through that trench print and you felt like okay what ways can i min max like going in and out of the trench um and yeah it just felt like you were part of the uh story rather than recreating it um mm -hmm. which i think is a problem i have with um Star Wars Squadrons, um, other than the fact that uh, its controls make me feel very, very nauseous when I play it. <laughs> um, like, I no control uh, scheme worked for me. I played five minutes of that game and said, nope, this game is not for me. <laughs> I'll get that. I'll be the first person to say I actually liked Battlefront 2015. But we'll talk about those later. My recommendation for this week for Star Wars is going to be Rebel Assault. I know it's probably expensive. It's probably at least 50 bucks at your retro game store. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. With the 
the classics that they've been doing on PS Plus, it might come to PS Plus one day. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because I know, what was the one that just came out? Star Wars Clone Wars. That just came out on PS Plus. And They not had the, the cartoon. the pod racing game as well, didn't it? Yeah, episode one and the pod racer. A lot of Star Wars games are coming out for PS Plus. A lot of PS2 games. Anyways, I'm thinking that'll eventually be there. So you, you can either wait or buy it for 50 bucks. I played it on GameCube. That's the best way to play it for me. But if they can remaster it on PS5 or do the PS2 classics thing and make the haptic triggers enabled. Oh, man. Just <laughs> instant day one, I'll delete everything off my console to make space. That's love, that is. I've got Red Dead Redemption 2 on there. I haven't played that game yet. I know it's heresy, but I have it being delivered because I rent my games. There's a service in the UK where you pay £10 a month and I can rent two games at a time. And I'll keep them for as long as I want. One of the ones I've got coming this week is Red Dead 2 because so many people have said you have to play. It's one of the greatest games ever. That's how I play a lot of my games. I try not to spend a full price on them. I just try to rent them because I don't often replay games unless I have a connection to them. I'm happy to just rent. So Red Dead's on its way. I hope you enjoy it. I haven't played very much. I'm probably like a few hours in, like 10, 15. As much as you can get into an open world game before it really just says, do what you want. And then you're like, oh, I really can do what I want. Let me do this. This is, I kind of tend to get lost on that aspect. A game rental service is how I played Split Second. I would do anything for a sequel to that game. I, It, one of the best racing games I've ever played. Need for Speed Unbound came close, but it focused too much on drifting. So that's my recommendation. Pick it up if you can, or uh, PlayStation, if you're somehow listening. <laughs> Please do it for your 30-year uh, anniversary, maybe. I know you're doing the, my first GT thing that I'm probably going to play because I've never played a Gran Turismo game. You've been having a really bad PS Plus lineup, so add that. Add Rebel Assault. Get the Disney lawyers on the phone. I second that. Since we're already talking about Star Wars games, um, let's move right into this discussion about Jedi Survivor. So first things first, what's been your experience with Star Wars games? Like, what's your favorite? I've enjoyed many over the years, like going back to N64 from Rogue Squadron and X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, uh, all the way up until the more recent games. You mentioned the Battlefront games and, of course, Star Wars Outlaws, which dropped uh, only a few weeks ago from Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I'm not as keen on things such as The Force Unleashed. I know a lot of people love that game, but controversially for me, I think... The Force Unleashed and certain aspects of the EU, the expanded universe, which Disney have now done away with. I think that skewed people's perspective of what they think
so involved as I wanted to be. Yeah, it, it felt like, and this is probably why I didn't pick it up, it felt like Ubisoft started at, let's make a Lando game, and then they, they said, well, okay, but what if we made something original instead? Mm -hmm. And now Lando's going to be a DLC that they do. Uh, I'll be interested to see how that's integrated, because it just felt like a Lando game to me, and then they inserted KVS into the story, and it feels de devoid of... Um, yeah, K is a cool character. I'll give her that. K is very cool, very likable. This is all known information, but mm -hmm. she doesn't know what she's doing. She's not really a smuggler. She does odd jobs around the city, and you grow with the character and make all the mistakes. But I understand what you mean. There are people saying that this is just a Han Solo or Orlando archetype character. So why isn't it that you know it, it would would it be fun to play as Han and Lando? Yes, but I do like having a new character to play with but then of course it depends on whether or not that character is interesting and it depends how they integrate the character into the story but i can't disagree with what you're saying about maybe their initial planning and what they maybe where they wanted to go but yeah because there have been um new characters that have really worked uh in the ea era iden versio comes to mind i really liked battlefront 2 in that aspect it felt like the first time and that's in Battlefront 2 for people who don't know. Battlefront 2, yes, it does have a story mode. It's a very good story mode, in my opinion. Yeah. The gameplay is not there, but because the it ends up... The story is great. It, but the story is great. Like, there is a, a scene where you... Which is basically feels ripped out of Halo Reach. I won't spoil it for people who haven't played the game, but this is really late in the game. It's the turning point mission. And it just really sold me on the game. Well, I guess it's the midpoint, but you know what I mean. But you've played it. I know exactly which one you mean, and I shall keep stum. But yeah, I feel like it, EA has done great characters before. It just seems like Ubisoft can't seem to crack it for whatever reason. Um, and it's their first go as well. Let's see if they get another crack. Yeah, and I think... Oh no, that's Quantic Dream. That's the other one that's coming up. Oh, Eclipse, yeah. That yeah. One, we assume it's coming out. I don't know yeah. when. Yeah, and I think there's one from... Amy Henning? Or there was an Amy Henning game. That got cancelled. I think the only ones in development at the minute are the Star Wars Jedi 3. The Star Wars Eclipse is still with Quantic Dream. I'm sure there was a strategy-based game they announced, and I thought there was another first-person shooter game being developed. Star and Wars Hunters. That was from I think Zynga. there's another one alongside that. Oh. Because there was Aspire were doing the Knights of the Old Republic remake, which... Who knows what's happening with that anymore? So classic Lucasfilm at the minute where things get announced, but until I'm actually holding it in my hand or watching it on the cinema, I'm never too sure whether they're actually going to uh, materialize. Yeah. But that said, as far as my history, when it comes to Star Wars games, it, it, it's very thin. I was very selective when it came to my Star Wars games. I didn't play the Jedi Knight or Jedi Academy games. I mainly stuck to Rebel Assault, Rogue uh, Squadron, Force Unleashed, you mentioned that earlier, Lego Star Wars, just one, just the first one. I played a little bit of Skywalker Saga, but I didn't play any of the movie games that came out. But yeah, Force Unleashed and all the Battlefront games I played. And really, the only one out of those I've really liked is the one I mentioned earlier, which was Rogue Squadron, because it just feels like you're part of the story instead of recreating the story but i would do anything for an actual like movie adaptation game adaptation sorry of the skywalker saga that isn't lego that would be amazing for me because i feel like an open world force awakens would be just amazing or even just that for uh, Rise of Skywalker. I know it's not the greatest m uh, movie, but that would make a great game. Uh, as far as how it's being treated now, I think the only ones I've really liked are the Jedi games. I picked up Fallen Order when it came to EA Play about a year or so ago. In, in the run-up to Jedi Survivor, actually. And it's what convinced me to pre-order Jedi Survivor, the, the digital deluxe edition. Because at, the, at that time, I was like, oh, maybe there's a season pass. Well, huh. No, there was not. But yeah, I've majorly liked um, the Rogue Squadron, the Battlefront games, 
and Force Unleashed, although Force Unleashed 2 really didn't work for me because it felt so much like a rehash of 1. And it, in defense of Force Unleashed, I think it works a lot better if you play it on the Wii, not on a console. Because on the Wii, it was all motion control. So your emote was your lightsaber. So you swung it around and then you used the nunchuck to move around. Mm -hmm. So for the longest time until a few years ago, I didn't play it on console. They're wildly different experiences. I think Force Unleashed on the Wii, the first one is the way to go. But Force Unleashed 2, I played that on console and oof, that was yeah. rough. But yeah. Fallen Order, we'll get into that a little bit here soon. But But it's a good game. But we'll get into my misgivings about that game here pretty shortly. So yeah, let's get to Fallen Order. What did you think of Fallen Order and how do you think Survivor compares? A big surprise to me. Uh, in short, I love that game. I really do. But it came as a surprise. When it came out in November 2019, we were about to get The Mandalorian. And of course, nobody really knew what that was going to be like because it was a first Disney Plus show. Would it be good? Would it be bad? We were coming up to the rise of Skywalker as well. So the conclusion of the saga. So there was lots of new things beginning, big things ending. The hype was massive for seemingly everything but Fallen Order. There was a lot of excitement for Fallen Order, but the rise of Skywalker, Mandalorian, people were very excited and anxious about these. Whereas for me, Fallen Order kind of slid in between them and comfortably was the best story out of all of them for me because it hit all of the hallmarks and the DNA of Star Wars. But the feelings of the themes of hope, love, family, tragedy, overcoming adversity, they're all there in Fallen Order, but they're packaged in an interesting story, Post Order 66, with a Jedi survivor. You get a new cast of characters who, for me, work so well together, this disparate band of, well, I can't call them no-gooders, but you know they say you've got a Jedi, an ex-Jedi, essentially a smuggler a night sister somehow they all work together but it's it is the fact that they were so intent on making sure that cal kestis was the star of the show he was the focal point what he felt we felt when he suffered we suffered when he rebuilt his lightsaber and we in, we exit that cave on Ilum with a lightsaber we feel like a jedi we then it's the moments of triumph in that game for me it's a perfect confluence of so many things is it a perfect game? No, it's not a perfect game. There are issues I have with it from a more mechanical standpoint or, or in some cases visual when it comes to things like the map or traversal. But in terms of the story and the characters, yeah, I think it's fair. fantastic. Never have I wanted to punt a, a fake droid more than when I look at that map in Fallen Order. Yes, there are things to mention as we go along like I, about how it actually stacks up in terms of what does it do better but that you know that's or immediately like the traversal is in full and order going back is not great but in terms of how survivor compares to that game by continuing the story organically it feels like like a successor notwithstanding its five-year time jump so it continues yeah. and builds upon those themes the characters and the gameplay of full and order both have exceptionally strong stories that continue to reside within the Star Wars, like I mentioned about the DNA, but they feel so distinct. So it compares to the game by... It doesn't reinvent the wheel of what Fallen Order gave us. It just says, well, you're this big. We're going to go this big now. We're going to go exponentially bigger in a lot of aspects. But that was my biggest fear and my biggest worry about going in is how will it compare? Because I really liked Fallen Order. And there were certain things I didn't want Survivor to do. And I feel like they didn't do that. They didn't go down the dark side and change things too much. They only added to that game. I'll echo that. Although I was a lot lower on Fallen Order than I thought I was when I played it. I forget how many years ago now. I feel like it was pretty recent. I think it, I feel like I played it during the pandemic. Like in 2021 or something like that. Because... I was I was going through EA Play. I had just gotten Xbox Game Pass. And with the Ultimate version, you get EA Play. 
So I was like, let me check out all these uh, Star Wars games, you know, Squadrons, Battlefront 2, Jedi Fallen Order. And the, the one out of all those three that stuck out to me was Fallen Order, but not in the way I thought. Because Fallen Order, for, I know I already talked about the map, but that map is that left led me to go around in circles especially i don't think i can spoil a five or six year old game now especially when you go to zepho zepho is another one where i probably spent three hours just like okay what is that last little bit of the puzzle i need to do because it gives you stats on how much you've explored there is one where i was 91 percent explored i'm like okay what is the last nine percent i went around for hours trying to figure it out Besides the map, I really like the combat of Fallen Order. I think that shouldn't be a surprise. Stig from the God of War series is part of this. While I didn't like the two God of War games I had played, I think it really works here. For those who, who want to know which God of War games I've played, it's God of War 3 and God of War 2018. I still haven't played a Ragnarok yet. Um, I'm waiting for that to eventually show up on PS Plus. If Sony decides to put that on however many years after release. But yeah, I love the combat. I loved the exploration. I think it felt really natural, but also really contained. Kind of like, it reminded me a lot of the exploration of Force Unleashed, actually. Where it wouldn't necessarily channel you down a hallway. But it would say, okay, what's that over there? What's that over there? In a similar vein to Breath of the Wild, um, where it's just like, hey, what's that over there? Let me go fight Ogdo Bogdo. I did not know what I was in for with that fight. That was genius. Putting that dude right at the beginning of the game on Bogano, where if you just fall down the hole, you think, oh, this lizard's not going to be too much. Without any of your skills or abilities... It is a real wake-up call, and I love that they just did that straight up the bat. You can traverse it by not falling down the hole, but if you do, then, yeah, good luck. Yeah, and it was this moment of like, okay, why is there a hole here? Yep. And I'm like, okay, let me see if I can go around it. Nope, okay, I'm fighting a, a frog with the health bar about this big. Yeah. <laughs> Despite that, you know, the, the combat was amazing. Like, I, I can't remember, could you throw lightsabers in fallen order i'm trying i think it might have been on the skill tree where where once you level up eventually you could throw in a straight line and back again you couldn't do anything particularly crazy with it yeah and jedi survivor that's one where it gets really crazy with that stuff yeah i i really liked it but i think there was a lot of room for improvement going into survivor I was really hoping to just build on that, like just say, okay, let's fix the things that really didn't work from Fallen Order. And I was hoping it would keep that sense that I am building my Jedi up. And it, I think it succeeds at that. I just expected it to expand and it did that and more. The story I have some misgivings about, but we'll talk about that a little bit in spoilers. But yeah, I, I, I just expected it to do more like, the dismemberment of uh, stormtroopers. That was a really weird thing where I'm like, okay, I'm late in the game and I'm <laughs> on this planet that I can't spoil the fallen order, but late in the game, you visit a planet that is very heavily hinted at being star killer base. Yeah. I can't chop off the people's arms. I know that was a Disney thing. That was <laughs> yeah, one was. thing on my wish list. I was like, fix the traversal because there were some times where the timing of the jumping, like the double jump especially, really didn't work. There's this puzzle on Bogano where you basically have to do a 180 turn from where you entered. I spent hours trying to figure that out. And, yeah. But it was just as simple as I mistimed the button presses. It it yeah. didn't reg it didn't give me a, enough grace in the button window to make that jump. So, but yeah, I think I just wanted it to be expanded upon. What I really wanted it to go maybe even deeper into that Order sixty six lore. But given the stuff that it released in that time since, I was like, okay, I'm good. If you don't, uh, I I really didn't have a lot of expectations. Just fix what was broken and do more better 
to yeah. put it bluntly. That's fair enough. Let's talk about Survivor a little bit. What were your first impressions of it when you booted it up for the first time? What did you think? I was trepidatious going into it more than anything because I wanted to respawn an EA to succeed because I really liked Fallen Order. I expected it to go bigger, as sequels tend to. So booting it up, I thought, oh no, it's it's the point of no return now. If this doesn't land, then well, let's just get it over and done with. But immediately upon booting up, we get the recap of Fallen Order in that really well done two minute story animation. And I felt like I was back home almost, back with my friend, back with the gang. I really enjoyed that as a way of getting people up to speed. Or if you haven't played Fallen Order, this is where we're at currently. So yes. I wasn't going in with anything like that. But I, w- I was very, very pleased when I booted it up. Just from like the UI, the look of it, the sat, like the quality of the music. Fallen Order soundtrack is great. It, it goes up tenfold in this game. At the opening cinematics and where we find Cal and the planet that we're on, the look of it, the the level of detail, I knew that Respawn were going to deliver something. Now, of course, the story could have ended up being terrible, and but those initial impressions, I was very impressed. It felt like putting on a, a comfortable pair of clothes again. Now, let's see how good they look when I go outside in them. I was very pleased with it kicking off. I'll echo that sentiment. I really loved it. That opening sequence, I won't spoil, but I think it was the first time where I looked at it and said, is this what current gen feels like? And I played it on Series S. It just blew me away. EA, if you're listening, please send me a PS5 copy. But yeah, it really sold me on like, oh, this is what current gen is about. This is like, you can zip around easier, I think. Yeah, I don't want to spoil the opening level, so <laughs> that's where I'll leave it at. It it just really imp- founded, okay, this is what a $70 game should be like. I was really blown away with it. Yeah, and you mentioned a price point. These games aren't cheap, and they're not accessible for everybody. I wouldn't be able to play any, really, because I haven't got 80 bucks to drop on a game without even knowing if I'm going to enjoy it. Unless it's one like this, or if it's Star Wars, I'll get it because I'm a sucker for it. But it it is expensive, and it's it's a good point you mentioned. that Booting it up and seeing the level design of that intro and how it all looks, it is encouraging to think this is a step up in every way, and they have utilised current-gen technology. It, It feels like an upgrade already. So what else can they deliver going forward? That's the exciting thing I felt about the game. If this part looks so good... You know, what, else is, what else is to come? Yeah. It was the first game I pre-ordered this generation. I really hope this is good because I put down the money. I mean, parents put down the money, but same Still difference. Money. But yeah, I, I, that's how sold I was from Fall in Order. I even picked up the Digital Deluxe Edition. I wanted the Han Solo stuff. I'm part of the problem. Mm-hmm. I know. I just thought Cal looks so cool in it. It blew me away. But jumping off of that, let's talk about what's new in Survivor. What were your impressions of this reversal system? At least if it isn't new, it feels new. You've got the new lightsaber stance system where you Mm -hmm. can switch between... Like, is it a spoiler if we talk about the stances? Like, It was definitely in the pre-release marketing. It's, It's well known prior to the game. EA did a very good job of utilising probably IGN to get little nuggets of information out. So yeah, the stances aren't a spoiler. Yeah. So yeah, you've got single blade, then double blade. Then you've got the blaster and single blade. And then you've got the cross card, which people went nuts over with the analyzing. Like, why does Kel have a cross card now? Is he Kylo Ren? Okay, come on, guys. That's when I knew Star Wars theories got, got off the rail. That's that's when I knew. But <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you've got the new stances, improved traversal. You can now customize Cal even more. Cool. Instead of just ponchos, you've got like actual jackets. You've got, I forget if you have like headbands or something like that. I don't think you do have headbands, but you have jeans. You can customize your holster if you're using the blaster stance. And, and of course, it's open world now. So yeah, like what are your thoughts on everything that's new? necessary 
but it was a necessary part of the next step. It, like you said, there are things in Fallen Order which, looking back now, potentially feel restrictive, but mm. actually Survivor's taken that and turned it into a mechanic, like the traverse tool, like the, the ability to fast travel. It is so welcome. When, when I played Fallen Order, I heard people saying, oh, where's fast travel? Why can't I do that? And I thought, why do people want to do that? Let's explore these planets. The amount of times I got stuck trying to get back to the Mantis hmm. and then now playing Survivor, I totally understand why people wanted fast travel. So I apologize to anyone who I naysayed about that. The map is still the map, but I do feel like it's slightly easier to navigate this time around. I think are uh, excellent because don't forget there was a dual world stance and some scenarios almost demand that you change your stance up if everyone has their favorite but sometimes you're almost required to change it up it wasn't mandatory but you being such as you had to do it you could just Leroy Jenkins in otherwise and just use your favorite stance but they did kind of nudge you into saying well you know you can use your double blade here or maybe you want to use the cross guard in this instance but I love that the game didn't strong arm you into doing that it didn't make you do it I like mm -hmm. that you, you being hamstrung to only having two stances i'm not really overly concerned about that i know lots of people wish that they could change up on the fly but to, to that i look at and think well that seems like a natural progression for the next game where you can just pick and choose as you want but you know i think the new additions to the game were necessary but they did just feel like a natural extension of what we got in fallen order similarly to new story beats new planets new characters and everything new felt like it fit and everything felt like a, there was there for a reason but in terms of the gameplay and the mechanics yeah everything they introduced necessary can you imagine not being able to traverse kobo if you didn't have certain additional ways of doing it if you didn't learn new yeah. skills in which you can get across the planet quicker it would be hellacious so yeah, I was very, very pleased with it, and I don't have any issues with any of the new things in the game. There are things that I wish you could do, which I can mention later on in the episode when we get to more sporely stuff, but nothing that broke the game for me, nothing that broke my immersion. So, I, yeah, I, I really like the new additions to the gameplay. I'll just echo that and say the only thing I really didn't like, which you already mentioned, is the stance system. I really felt like there were times where I looked at Cal and I'm like, you've got the blaster right there. Just let me use the blaster. <laughs> I get it. And I would have been okay if they had blocked that to a skill you had to learn or the cool down or something like that. Because it, you're, you'll remember in Fallen Order, when you bring the dual wield into the, I forget what the stance is called, but where you bring the two uh, lightsabers together. But in Fallen Order, you could bring the dual wield and then bring them together to form yeah. one lightsaber with two ends. Um, and that had a cooldown. I would have been okay with something like that, like that. But I also do agree that maybe that's something that for story's sake, it made more sense to be like, well, okay, would Cal realistically do this in this situation? Mm -hmm. And I think it, it reinforced strategy into the combat where... I, I feel like in Fallen Order, one of the many things that I didn't like about it is you could just button mash yeah. in that game. You could feel like, okay, I'm just going to slice this dude up. Perfect time dodge, slice, slice. Perfect time dodge, slice, slice. But in this game, it's like, okay, if I pick the cross guard, my timing might be off on a swing. Or if I throw my dual wield sabers, mm -hmm. I might leave myself open to attack. And then you're really in trouble. Uh, especially later on. But yeah, I understand it. I do think everything really is improved, especially the exploration. The planets felt stacked, unlike they did in Fallen Order. Fallen Order felt like level one, level two, level three. But here it's mm -hmm. like you're just going deeper into the planet's surface instead of just levels, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because... Especially with, there's a elevator you take in Fallen Order that goes from the surface all the way down to like, I, I would assume would be the planet's core or very close to it. And it's like, you're sitting there in the elevator for about two minutes, just twirling your thumbs like, okay. Let's... Whilst the game's loading around you. 
But here, I don't know if this is a spoiler, so stop me if it is. But you get these mounts where you can jump onto, like, I forget what they're called, but they're like big birds. That was in the trailer. They're big birds where you can just jump onto and then go from a high position down to a low position. There's a, a boss fight where you need to do that. As soon as you land, you instantly go into a boss fight. But um, you can see it, though. Whereas with, with the elevator, like you mentioned, full in order, you are just kind of waiting for the game to load around you. In these instances, when you're traversing on on any specific animals, whatever, you can you can see your destinations. So it doesn't feel like a, a cop-out, like a loading screen, yeah. for example. If you do it wrong, well, you better do it again because you're not going to get to where you need to go. There's this one puzzle where it relies on a bird and you have to go through updrafts. I forget their actual name, but they're basically a mix of a dragon and a bird. This is where we're already talking about exploration. What did you think of the more ex- open world exploration? I liked it. I liked the mix of exploration and platforming this time around, because at times, certainly on specific planets, you can explore as much as you want, and it's fairly simple to traverse. Other times in the game, they go really platform heavy. Mm-hmm. And it takes over certain certain elements of the ludo narrative dissonance come to the fore. Where you kind of like, well, why is that there? And it's a bit convenient that that specific thing is there for me yeah. to ha- hook onto. But it's a game I can get past that quite quickly. Uh, I, I will say Outlaws does that better, though. It you know your traversal and platforming it feels a bit more organic to your environment. But uh, yeah, no, I I really like the exploration because, like you said, they feel stacked. Certain areas and planets feel big they feel diverse it isn't just you know in some some instances anyway it's not just here is a like sand planet there is well here's planet but you can do this this and this and each part feels different i really like that and you can just do the main story you can just go ahead and do the beats or you can follow side quests or follow rumors and get a more rich experience out of the game that's where it differs from fallen order which fallen order was linear it was a story go and do it like you mentioned whereas survivor it is here's a story go and do it but it's also you could do that but what does that guy over there say what does this person say what can i get and you get things out of it which aren't just cosmetics so it's a bigger game in that sense it does reward exploration and the exploration is fun as well, mm-hmm. I thought. You know, not again, as much as I put this game up there with any. Of of course, there are times when you can explore and you think, "Oh, come on, I just want to get to the next part. I just want to get this bit done with." But because it is a big game, I almost kind of give it a slight pass. But there's so much I enjoy that the moments that do lag a little bit, the few and far between, because the exploration is great fun. I think. Yeah, adding on top of that, there are Metroidvania elements to it, especially on the hub planet Kobo. You see something, and this is maybe where I'm getting my Breath of the Wild inspiration from, is you can look at something on Kobo and be like, ah, I don't know how to do that yet. Let me come back later. Yeah. I think that's done better because in Fallen Order, there's stuff where I feel like I can do that. And then you're like, oh, no, I can't do that. And then you just feel kind of defeated, which is not a good feeling to have in a game. Not when you're trying to be a Jedi. Yeah. This game really says no. If you can get over there, you can figure it out. The game's a lot better at telling you when it's time to be like, hey, you can't get here yet. I I, I forget what specific scenario it was, but there's a place on Kobo where I was like, I saw a place for something and I'm like, ah, I think I know what I need Mm -hmm. to get here. I don't have that, but I'm glad I see it so I can make notes to come back here later. But that's the fun. You get rewarded for it. And and it isn't just go over there and, hey, cool, that was fun. There, there is something at the end of it, or there is a little bit of a lore dump or something for the data bank. Or you mentioned the customization is insane in this game. Like, to the detail with which you can customize almost every aspect of Cal and his equipment. You almost want to explore just so you can find out what else you can yeah. use. And I really appreciate that. You mentioned the price point. It's a big, it's an expensive game. I feel like I got you know i feel like people will get their money's worth out of this game so you get out as much as you put in but i think there's so much to get out of this i was excited to explore certain planets which i I can't always say about similar games 
Um, I actually want to see how much time I put into this game. I'm seeing if I can look it up. I'll see. Survivor. I don't know how much I put in. I put in two days, five hours, and 21 minutes. Wow. In game. 50 hours, give or take. I think I've put just shy of 100 hours in, but that is over the course of a year and a half almost. Yeah. But that, that, that's tiny compared to some people. Uh, I have played through the game on more than one occasion as well. Yeah, I started a new game plus when they added that in later. I, I think we're talking about price point. And it, it's fantastic for the price. Let's see. Going off that, I know we've talked about the stance system. We've talked... A little bit about the exploration. Do we want to give some time to the puzzle system and traversal? I don't feel like they're really that much improved, but we can talk about it if we want. I think Fallen, Fallen Order was very heavy on its puzzling, and some of it was extremely puzzling. Some of it was like, ridiculously convoluted, like you've got to throw the ball there, and then you've got to push something there, and you've got to use wind to get that. It was a little bit too much at times. So I think here in Survivor, the, the puzzles are far more sporadic, which I appreciate. You, you don't even have to do them to complete the game, which is great. There are still puzzles in the game and there is still one which left me almost throwing my control at the wall, just could not get it. But they are a lot less challenging this time, I'd say. Or they're as challenging, challenging as you want them to be because it's up to you whether you do some of them. I appreciate that. I don't like games being for want of a better term, dumbed down, but like mm -hmm. games being made so easy that they're not a challenge. But at the same time, with a game like Survivor, there's so much going on. I don't think you need to be bogged down and spending an extra hour or two on a specific puzzle because, like you mentioned, you've got to get the reaction time just right and you've got to pull this and that. There needs to be an element of user-friendly, user-friendability, user if you will, to it. I think Survivor had a better balance of gameplay uh, satisfying gameplay, satisfying puzzling, then fall in order just because there's less of them, just because there's less to do. Yeah. And on that note, I think it made it easier because I think there's a certain setting you can do on one of the easier difficulties because I'll play on easy first, then play on normal, and then whatever Same. from there because I like to enjoy the game first and then go from there. I don't want to be spoiled either. Austin, I played fall in order. Oh, I'll never forget. And everyone will say, well, that's on you. Maybe. I play, I was playing Fallen Order. I was getting to the end. No spoilers. No spoilers. Guys. I was getting mm -hmm. to the end. And anyone who's played Fallen Order, you know what happens at the end. You know, like, wow, the big wow moment. I, I went on YouTube to look at, a, I think I was looking at a recipe or something, like a name. And in the, in the sidebar was, you know, thumbnail with what was happening in the end. And I was like, man, I got like, the that same whole, spoiler. Whole, you, exactly. So that whole thing got spoiled for me. It didn't make it any less awesome. So what I found since then with with Survivor and Outlaws as well is I'll play on story mode. I will blast. I'll, I'll blast through the story. I'll enjoy it still, but I, I want to experience a story for myself. I want the story to dictate how I feel. Not oh, I know what's coming, so I'll prepare for it, and then I'll go back and do a lot more. On my first play through Survivor. Less exploration, more story. Also, because I was just so into the story. I didn't want to get spoiled, dude, because, you know, the spoiler culture we live in now, I'm with you. E e easy to start with and then more challenging the second time round. I say that because I think there's a setting where you can have it hint at puzzles. And that was really helpful for me because I'm really bad at puzzles. <laughs> like, <laughs> you talk about throw controller moments. That was Zepho for me with Fall Order. I had to quit the game for like two days. I know which bit you uh, mean. Or uh, bits you mean. Yeah, the ball thing. I was like, oh my gosh. I, I was stuck on that for days. It just didn't feel... And again, I love that. And I'll, I'll never stop saying how much I love these games. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, nothing is immune from criticism. Some of those puzzles in the first game, it didn't feel like a natural thing. Maybe hardcore gamers will say... It did, but um, you got to do that. It, it just didn't feel like an organic way of doing the puzzles. It felt a little bit convoluted and wasn't the most enjoyable. Even on second, third, fourth, fifth playthrough of, the, of Fallen Order, I still struggle, even though I know how to do it. I still struggle on 
how to actually complete these puzzles. And yeah, that is one of the drawbacks from that game. Yeah, but but I'm glad it's being a little bit more accessible this playthrough there were points where i'm just like i i don't know if i want to keep playing this game so points for that getting more into the story and characters let's talk about the new and returning characters what do you think of the new and returning characters i don't want to spoil too much well first off greasy money baby is what i think about grease but um yeah that, as a top level thought i think everyone is built upon and everyone gets their moment the, ca- the characters' journeys in this game feel earned. They feel like a natural progression from Fallen Order, including that time jump between games. It doesn't feel like w- they are totally different to whom we meet in that first game, because if characters are in a different place, everything is explained, everything is extolled upon us, but without sitting in front of a PowerPoint presentation, it's all done by a dialogue, of which I think the writing is very good. Uh, yeah, I think the new, so the in a non-spoiler aspect, I think the returning characters are all handled very well. In terms of the new characters, they're integrated very seamlessly into the story and the world that Respawn have created. I think the character that's in the trailer, Bo, is such a cool, compelling character. The introduction of one of the antagonists that we see in the trailer mm-hmm. seemed like a very huge left-field pitch at the time. I think it works well enough. There's a few things I'd like to have seen differently. And the new baddies in this, the new villains are... I don't want to say they're a mixed bag because I think they're all very good. I just think they're different levels of good. And the... Inter- and the again, it's with, okay, I won't go any further because of spoilers, but yeah. I, I, think, I, I think everyone here serves a purpose. I think the majority are handled very well or brought back in. There are some instances though where I think... I would have liked a bit more with you and I'd have liked to have heard a bit more about what you can bring to the table, but there wasn't anyone I thought, you know, we don't, we don't need you. But what about, what about you? Are you, are you a fan of, as, as someone who played Fallen Order quite close to playing Survivor, did it feel natural? So no, um, because for those who aren't in the know, and this is going to be an extremely Star Wars nerdy thing, for me to say, but they released a tie-in book that I covers that. There. Yeah, Bat- it's called Battle Scars. Yes. Um, that I read like the week before it released, and I feel like some of those details are really important. Uh, when you're playing Jedi Survivor, and the game completely leaves out, and I'm like, because again, you said five-year time jump. And yeah. I I read that a book and I'm like, oh, this should this should have been in the game. This should have been in the game. Even if it's just that uh, I know we talked about it earlier, that two minute um, recap mm-hmm. um, of just like, hey, what's here? Here's what everyone's been up to. Here's Fallen Order. And then here's the what happened a, a little bit. I, I don't know. Maybe they could have reworked some things to work parts of the book in. But, and Respawn helped in the development of that book as well, yeah, to an extent. Yeah. And and the book as well, I will say, listen, Austin, I'm saying how much I love these games. <laughs> you know, I, I would die in the head of these games. That book, though, oh, the first half of that it's, is... It's rough. It is a rough. But the second half is a lot better when it gets into its group. But the first half is... It is bad at times. And I don't like saying that, but it, it ain't good. But it gets better. I wish I still had screenshots that I took while reading on Kindle because my uh, library allows you to rent um, eBooks um, nice. a- and allows you to like, port it over to your Kindle library. Um, and um, literally the first half of it, it, the way it's written is just recapping things that just happened, uh, like being... <clears throat> so in detail about things that are happening that it's just like come on with it already like yeah the first chapter is um this isn't spoilers because it happens in the first five pages it's just a spacewalk with uh cal and it's describing everything he's doing in explicit detail and i'm like dude let's just move on we understand how a spacewalk works um and it's not always 
particularly well described. And there are times when certain characters don't quite feel like they've been adapted excellently. Certain characters like Grease and Seer, I think, are very well written. You know, I'll give Sam Maggs all the credit in the world. I think she captures them very well. Cal and Marion, they kind of fluctuate between being the characters I know and love and, ooh, I don't know about that, but I kind of headcanon it as in everyone grows, experiences change people, so they're not going to be the same, but I also look at it and say that's just terrible writing at some points. It's just not great. And yeah, I know what you mean. There are there are some instances, like the book lays the foundations for where people went, where, where we start Survivor. So I wouldn't... And... and the dialogue of the game does go, it, it touches upon things. Mm -hmm. But of course, like you say, had had they had a prologue where it was not adapting parts of the novel, but just little bits, then I think that would have been a very, very handy way to get people up to speed. But at the same time, I think the game itself, the way, it, the, way the story plays out, I think it wants you to kind of find this out as you go along. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are things which I think, yep, they could have probably expanded upon slightly. Yeah, and there's stuff, specific stuff we'll talk about in spoilers uh, mm. because we've got a lot to talk about in the spoilers. I feel like the whole game is spoilers, but um, oh, yeah. but yeah, that's that's the one major criticism I can levy against this game um, is that it the character development is kind of hamstrung by um, by having that companion book um fill in some of those blanks um i mean the game does a great job but like there there are specific characters i'm trying to dodge spoilers for the game <laughs> yeah um where it really explicitly colors in some lines that you really need to know for the book for the game so yeah. so that's really the only big um piece of criticism um and then let's actually skip this larger Star Wars universe question. Um, so let's get into um, how did the most controversial part of, I, I think, the game upon launch, um, something that I'm still running into problems with. How did the game perform for you? I am extremely sorry to say that the game ran very smoothly for me on my PlayStation 5. I I ran into no errors, uh, genuinely. You know, every now and then you'd get a, a glitch or something where you might see a stormtrooper in the distance rather than walking is kind of floating. But mm -hmm. in terms of like game breaking issues, none whatsoever. And I that's well, I do feel bad for everybody who has suffered, and I'm not going to pretend that this game hasn't had issues. This is, I think, comfortably the worst AAA re like release launch since obviously since Cyberpunk 2077, yeah. and that is much, and that is painful to say because I wanted everything about this to be perfect, and it it does you know it, it it upsets me in that kind of detached way when I hear that so many people didn't have the same experience that I did, and I think I just got lucky. I must have done. Because I, I genuinely didn't have any of the, the issues uh, that anybody else has. And I've since watched lots of YouTube videos and listened to lots of podcasts where people are saying, you know, I, I like the game, but I can't put it in top tier. or I can't put it in a game of the year conversation because, at the time because it was horrific on launch. I didn't experience that. So I can't speak to the issue. So I am quite interested in hearing what what actually went wrong when you played it then. So uh, the game crashed for me five times during week of release. And when, mm. when I say crash, I don't mean like just like stopped and then like started back up. I meant the game force closed itself um, and then asked me to submit a bug, bug report um, because that's what Xbox does. Is like every time it force closes a game, it'll ask you to submit a bug report. So I submitted five different bug reports saying the exact same thing. It's like, I was just playing the game and uh, it froze and then the game closed. Um, and then um, I actually have a YouTube short of this one. Um, so I'll, I'll include it in the YouTube description. Um, but I was going down a zip line 
and I happened to turn the camera so you could see uh, Cal's face and yeah. his hair was like spikes <laughs> uh, in like 300 different directions. Um, and obviously it looks worse on my end because it's on the Series S, um, which is a less powerful console. But um, but yeah, I it, it I ran into a bunch of bugs. Some I didn't even like document, but um, mm. it, it crashed heaps of times um, to the point where at one point I got midway through the game and I'm like, I'm going to stop playing until the next patch because at that yeah. point they were talking. Uh, Respawn was like, here's we're going to here's our first uh, launch post launch patch. Uh, it's supposed to fix like a hundred plus problems, and I waited uh, for that to finish the game. Um, but some problems still aren't fixed. Um, so I hear, yeah, like dynamic um, resolution scaling, which is for those who aren't aware, um, is where like things that are far away um, are lower resolution, but things that are uh, closer to the camera are higher resolution. Um, sometimes it would just fail to render um, certain uh, instances, especially on Kobo is the main uh, problem area, or I guess problem planet. Um, yeah. Um, especially in like the little uh, water pools where you'll find the uh, fish guy, um, Scuba. 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 Oh, that yeah. guy. Um, which I didn't even mention him in New and Returning Characters. He's my, one of my favorites. Uh, guys, guy is great. I I could sit and watch that, listen to that guy's stories all day, and I did more I than did. once. But yeah, um, it's I, just just to your point though. We, I mean, sorry to interject, but we, we no, mentioned we, yeah. we've kind of we've praised the price point so much and said, well, the game gives you so much, but let's not pretend. I, I mean, I, I'm, I obviously I'm kind of speaking vicariously through you now. You you know you you laid out a lot of money for this game, mm -hmm. got part way through and thought, do you know what? I'm not going to play until they sort this out. That is not value for money. So it, it, on one hand it is, on the other hand, you get so many technical issues that your emotional experience is destroyed. And that is what really frustrates me. It shouldn't have been released in the state it was. And that unfortunately does go to Stig Asmussen, who was the one who okayed it for release. Not EA, not Respawn. It was, I love Stig, but it was Stig who did it. And there is no way this game should have been released in that yeah. state because for you, you spent all that money and you didn't get the same experience I did, which is you know, is maddening for me because it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, like I was literally um, in the middle of a boss fight once and it forced closed and I had to replay an hour of the game because, yeah. and that's another thing, the autosave system is not kind in this, in this version mm -hmm. versus... Um, Jedi uh fallen order. Yeah. Um but yeah, that's that was the, like the one major detractor for me. I I need to go back and reinstall it. Um I'd be interested to see um with the Xbox One release if I if I get the choice because you know Xbox does this thing called smart delivery. If there's a way I can install the Xbox One version and the Series S version to get, compare. Um mm -hmm. Because that would be kind of interesting just to see. Um, because I wonder if performance would be better if I forced it to play the Xbox One version. Yeah, it's good to call. Um, because then you don't have to, the constraints of like, hey, we want you to render this at you know 1440p and then downsample to my TV in the living room that's 1080p. Um, and, and, and instead just render 1080p at like five frames per second or whatever. Um, so yeah, um, but, but yeah, and that's the main reason we're talking about it today is it's now on Xbox one and PS4. And that makes me really, crazy. yeah, it's crazy. Right. Because they said, mm -hmm. um, in the run up to the game's release, Hey, we're not going to be able to put this on, uh, past gen now. Um, I, I don't call PS4 and Xbox one current gen. It, no, I mean, technically it is. But uh, college football twenty five is not on PS four and Xbox One, so <laughs> PS five and Xbox Series are current gen. Um, although Madden twenty five is still on PS four and Xbox One, but but that's beside the point. 
I, I would really be interested to see how it performs on there. Um, but yeah, um, really quick, um, before we get yeah. into spoilers, and don't don't worry, everyone, if you haven't played the game, um, I'll have a spoiler warning um, after we talk, after we wrap up. But um, I just want to, um, before we get into spoilers, what did what is your like final rating of the game out of five stars? It won't come as any surprise to anyone. I am um, you call me biased. This is a, this is a five star game for me. Mm. It is a five because I can in in my experience, like I didn't have the technical issues, I didn't have the bugs, I didn't have the errors and the crashes, so I can only rate it on my experience. How did I feel going into it? How did I feel having played it? Did the moments hit throughout which were intended to? Did I get what I wanted from the characters? The, did the new ones hit? Do I feel like there's a place for this story? Was it emotionally? Everything is a yes for me. So it would be easy to say, oh, he's a Star Wars fan. He's going to give it five out of five. But I, I don't give an awful lot five out of five. Jim. And that goes in terms of film reviews as well. There's not much I will give. I'll give fives when I want to. I, I'm not. It's not a holy thing where you can't give it a five, but I don't give yeah. it to everything. But as I as a critic, I believe that my review should be based on my experience, not what I feel like you guys should be getting. Is what did I get, and I have to then explain why, or you know, extol upon you why it gave me those feelings and emotions and reactions to warrant such a high score, and that that's what it is. It's, it's an emotive thing reviewing. You know what I mean? You, you, you could look at it and say, well, hold on, five out of five for this film. That's the same as Godfather 2. So, yeah, but I'm not saying it is on the same level. I'm just saying, you know, this, fi this film or this game did everything I wanted to do. So for me, it's a five. But I don't expect anybody else to say that. And I'm interested to see what you would give this game. So I give it a four. Um, that's a good score still. Yeah, I mean, I it's, it equates to an eight out of ten uh, on the IGN scale. Uh, yep. or on a regular video game scale. Um, I just don't like using 10 points because I think it gets too granular at that point. Um, but anyhow, uh, I give it that because I had a litany of technical issues. I mean, yeah. a litany. Uh, I bet... Well, I don't want to bet that it, it's still like that today. I know they didn't do it. Uh, Respawn didn't issue another patch when the Xbox One version came out, uh, literally today as we're recording this. Um, mm. But um, but I would, I, I'm, I'm curious how, how it runs now. Um, and maybe I'll like post a thing on threads or something about like, hey, you know how I complained about this on Twitter? Well, here's my new uh, like evaluation of it. Because I do still have that new game plus save file. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, four stars because of the technical issues, but not just because of that. Um, uh, I have a lot of issues with the story, um, that we'll talk about in spoilers. Uh, I wish I could talk about the story in spoiler free discussion, but literally all my problems have to do with spoilers. Um, like I know we talked about uh, one of the antagonists. I literally can't say his name because I feel like that spoils a big part of the game's story. Um, and I won't say why, because that's also a spoiler in and of, in and of itself. Um, so yeah, I the story didn't work for me, and not just because I think it relies a lot on the companion book, um, but also I don't, don't think it stands as well on its own shoulders or as on its own uh, on its own merits that Jedi Fallen Order did like Jedi Fallen Order really was like yeah it's post Order 66 but here are some twists that you weren't expecting here are like uh, themes of trauma found family um, forgiveness um, and all these things that even if you're not a Star Wars fan you can really sink your teeth into you know look up the gamers little playground movie uh that's probably three or four hours and i think you'll have the same experience now if but i can't say that somebody else 
who had that experience playing Fallen Order would have that experience, especially if they haven't read the book. Um, so yeah, I just think it leans a little bit too much on the companion book, but I understand that's a uh, byproduct, so to speak, of Disney Star Wars is that every um, thing that comes out, even the Acolyte, um, I know, I think we were talking about it in the pre-show um, before we hit record, um, the Acolyte, you know, it's going to have its own book that I think continues yeah. its, its story. And it's like, okay, I don't really need a book for that, but it, literally everything um, has, a, uh, literally everything Star Wars now has a companion book uh, that either explains or continues the story from something you've either seen or played before. So yeah, um, that's why I give it a four. Maybe it'll go up to a five if those issues are fixed uh mm -hmm. and, and i play it again um but i I'm, I'm gonna use the gamer meme of press x to doubt um <laughs> because th they were very serious foundational problems uh that yeah. we'll get into when talking about spoilers but um i guess speaking of spoilers um this is your point of no return uh we're gonna be delivered we're going to be delving into uh, the game's plot, any questions we have about the game very, very shortly. So if you haven't played the game and I want to avoid spoilers, uh, I'll have a chapter mark either final thoughts or social media plugs. Either one of those uh, are in the uh, episode's description on YouTube or your favorite podcast service. You should, uh, fingers crossed, uh, should, um, be able to click on one of those and it'll take you right to the uh spoiler free uh discussion where we're just like giving final thoughts or plugging our stuff so um now that that's said let's talk about bode big bode well this is going to be a fun discussion because um obviously i i, I really have an affinity with the story and the characters and i'm really excited to hear you know your your perspective on them and how it differs from mine. And that's, that's the beauty of having a discussion uh, on the internet with people who aren't crazy that, you know, I, you, we can accept each other's point of view without trying to kill each other. But uh, Bode, right. This, listen, straight up, I suspected nothing. I did not see anything coming. Now, I know some people say they knew immediately that Bode was going to be, a bad egg and you you yourself may have thought that but for me I, I didn't i did not see it at all of course there are in hindsight there are there are red flags there when i was in like really just going for it for the first playthrough i didn't suspect anything i was just like okay this guy's this guy's a cool dude and bode is a cool dude i mean mm -hmm. the way he uses that jetpack i'm like man you're so cool but we better get one in number three the way uh, cal talks about how much he likes jetpacks that is one thing I think, oh, it's something like that. I also think we're going to finally be able to fly the Mantis. I think that's one of the mechanics they're going to bring in is we'll be flying that ship, which, uh, okay, well, I'll save that for later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Bode, I didn't suspect it because I, I believed in the the bond that those characters had. A lot of that was due to No Shea Delau's voice performance, voice acting. I think he's fantastic, as is Cameron Monaghan, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I didn't. You know, Looking back, I could see it. He's a desperate father. He tries to talk Cal out of going to Tanalor with the hidden path for fear of the Empire finding them and knowing that Cal can't hold the Empire back. I was floored, though, when the twist happened. You know, somebody who loves Star Wars and just loves good storytelling. I was floored when the twist happened. The force push was one thing. But then when he says, you're not the only one who survived. You know, I jaw hit the floor. I was like, okay, where did this come from? And I'm in. Did, is this something which you saw from a mile off? A mile away. Like, you did? More than a mile. Like, if it, instead of a mile, I saw it from like a yard. Or the trailer like yeah. yeah like i saw it from like the next continent over like as <laughs> soon as i saw wow. him like like we're talking we talked about the intro level where like bode helps you up i'm like i don't trust this guy he there's something off about him and mm -hmm. then like i play more more through the game and uh, like you see his red flags and i'm like mm, something's fishy and then like 
just before it happens, I'm like, he's about to turn on us. Um, now, did I know he was a double agent the whole time? Not for certain until like right before we get to um, Jetta, um, the third time, I believe, um, when <sighs> we have to deliver the MacGuffin device to um, the guy from the first game. Um, Cordova. Yeah, Cordova. Uh, which that was more of a surprise than uh, Bode being the traitor. Um, I was like, you see him for the first time, I'm like, you're yeah. alive? And the music swells, and I'm like, God, this is great. <laughs> I'm, I'm here, I'm so in. Like, I was BD8, uh, not BD8. No, B yeah, BD8. Uh, BD1. BD1, thank you. Um, I was BD1 in that moment where I'm like, what? <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it, I, I saw it coming from a while away. I do think they did a really good job of motivations. Um, like for um, like his motivations being like, hey, I got to keep my daughter safe. Uh, and I made a deal with the Empire so that yeah, as long as I'm working for them, she is safe. Like I could understand that. And I think they did that very well. Now the whole like, you're not the only Jedi survivor. I'm like okay. Oh, I loved it. I I was uh, hitting my uh, I was face palming when I heard that line because what, what, what was it that just didn't work then? It felt like a real um, oh let's roll credits moment. He said the name of the game, <laughs> um, and like I'm not like um, Cinema Sins or anything like that where I'm like oh he said the name, yeah, <laughs> um, but like. But but I am of the notion of like when somebody says the title of some something like uh, Will Smith and uh, Suicide Squad, like what are we some kind of Suicide Squad or something oh. like that, um, or like uh, end of Fantastic Four twenty fifteen where it's like uh, say that again, it's fantastic. Um, it's like okay, come on. There are it, ways to finesse it. Yeah, like I felt like there was a bit uh, like just a force push was enough to be like oh. He's a Jedi. Okay, cool. I can operate from there. Like, I didn't need to hear anything. Um, although I will say, I really did like um, the first boss fight you have with him. I, I, I hesitate to call it even a boss fight uh, because you lose. And the game treats it like, uh, no, this is game over. The game's over. Uh, and then it's like, oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the that, respawn screen comes up, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, and then I'm like, okay, yeah. I would have been fine if that's how the game ended, honestly. Um, because it, because I think I have a sick, uh, twisted thing in my mind where I'm like, I want the, the hero to lose because, <laughs> um, like, um, spoilers for Ahsoka, play the siren from the Death Star, uh, the klaxon sound. Um, but uh, in Ahsoka, at the end of that miniseries, they lose. Mm -hmm. And that was re that really worked for me. Because it's like, yeah, that's what would realistically happen in a situation where you just learned, uh, and really deep spoilers for Ahsoka now, um, that Thrawn is alive, the, the Night Sisters of Dathomir are alive, and that um, the one um, person from Mandalorian Season 2 or three, uh, the magistrate is also a night. Yes, sister. Morgan. Yep. Yeah. Um, is a night sister. I'm like, okay, yeah. Realistically, there's no winning this situation. Plus, you came out of some weird time vortex thing. But I really love um that aspect of things. But yeah, um, uh, yeah. I I just have that sick twisted part of me. I'm I'm like, oh yeah, I love when heroes lose. But um, it, is, it, it, it is a nice change up, though, isn't it? Sometimes Empire Strikes Back to an extent did that. Of course, at the end, you get the hopeful ending. Same with Revenge of the Sith, if we're going to keep it in universe, because you need it sometimes. You need heroes have got to bounce back from something eventually, because mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't anticipate the end of this series being so doom and gloom that you look back at the series and think, oh, my God, that was that was depressing. But you do you need adversity. You need to overcome something. And I agree. That's what I like about that kind of, that mini boss fight. 
I really quite like because if you think about everything that leads up to it, especially from the first game, listen, cow, everyone cow ever gets close to dies mm -hmm. from the beginning of Fallen Order with his mate Prowf to his master Jaro to Paul to an extent the second sister. You know, they, they started to understand each other uh, in this game. His entire crew on Coruscant, um, Cordova, Bode himself betrayed him. Nothing this guy does ends well, Cal. And now he thinks he's finally got a chance to be free. They've got the MacGuffin. They can go to Tanalor. And Bode, of all people, mm. his brother, turns on him, murders Cordova, and runs off. The guy, you, know, you would not be in any kind of headspace to deal with that, which is why I quite like the fact that... And also finding out that he's an ex-Jedi. You imagine what that does to the psyche. So I quite like the fact that they just went through with it and Bode, Bode has the upper hand and he has the high ground in every sense there. So I'm glad that they went through with that. And of course it leads us into a spectacular set piece after that, I think. Yeah, the chase and everything. Bit, bit spectacular. I'll take 14 more. Yeah. Um, But I guess speaking of like uh, sick and twisted desires, uh, Cal, uh, taps into his dark side in this game um how, how you, do you were feel? you happy about that i'm real happy about that <laughs> oh my gosh because it for one it makes character sense because he's like this tortured jedi he's not a regular jedi like i almost feel like it makes more sense to um have a a, a um jedi who grew up in the order 66 era to have like tap into the dark side. Um, I almost thought that's something that should Kane and Jerish should have done uh, in rebels. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a bunch of the other Jedis. I, I don't think we should be having so many ordered 66 era Jedis. We, we, we can move away from that, but, um, but yeah, I think it worked very well for his character. And I think it worked really well for the gameplay too. I think it almost works as, you know, Stig, you know, he, he worked on the God of War games. It works kind of as this kind of rage mode mechanic. Yeah. And I think it just works very well. And I think the first time it happens, I actually, I don't think I know the first time it happened, I was like, oh, you're all dead. <laughs> yeah, here we go. It's like when... It's like time slows down. The screen turns red, and it's <laughs> they're just, not subtle, are they? <laughs> it, no, nah, it was just like he is on a uh, no, uh, no, uh, no if ands or or buts about it. But he is on demon mode. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It was fantastic. I hope that they uh, kind of continue that into the third game. Uh, because yeah, I think it, it was inevitable. I think from the beginning yeah. of this game, it was inevitable that this was going to happen and had to happen. Sia, his master or his second master, she she tapped into the dark side. That was an extremely important part of Fallen Order. Yeah. And, you know, an extremely important part of why she set up the archive on Jeddah so she could preserve the good, preserve the Jedi. At the beginning of the game, Cal, you see him snarling at the Ninth Sister when she kills his crew. You know, he's... He's about to throw down. He's ready to slice her up. And of course, he does. He, Cal's insistence on fighting, like actual fighting throughout the game. Mm -hmm. He loses Seer, loses his friends, Bode's betrayal, it, you know, everything. It felt inevitable that this was going to happen. And it, like you say, it's rage, but it's a cheat code almost, isn't it? It gives the player yeah. like an easy out. And that's not, it felt good using the dark side, the allure, the seduction. And that's the thing. And the, and the and the devs knew that the dark side is an easy route, but one that it can consume you. As soon as I had that option to use a dark side, for the dark side power, sorry, from that moment on, I can't use it as much as I could. I, I was yeah. like, I need to get out of this situation. There's five purge troopers and ten storm troopers coming at me. I'm not messing around here. Dark side, throw this, throw the saber, kill every single one of them, and get on with it. You know, I I gave in to the dark side in that moment and I I was very pleased to do so. And I absolutely think Cal will be dealing with it going forward. Like and then in I don't know the next story depends as well on the time jump. Is it going to be a year later, six months, five years? Are they gonna you know how what are they going to do with that? You have to. 
I kind of do. I do wonder if it's going to be another five year time jump because five years of somebody struggling that badly with the dark side will weigh upon you. So I do wonder if this in this case, they'll say, right, we're having we're having a two year time jump. So it's easier to kind of explain why he has, you know, we can look at the his relationship with the dark side. But then also there are other characters that get brought into the family. How are they going to do it? There's a lot to work with. And I think that dark side thing is going to I think that's going to be the catalyst going forward. So I'm really pleased that they dealt with it, started it here and didn't introduce it in the third and probably final game and kind of rushed through it. So I yeah. like that we get to use it here. And again. It was very fun. <laughs> very fun. Kind of like when you get the dual wield uh, sabers at the end of Fallen Order. Come on, yeah. Like, yeah. come on. Um, but um, I know we talked about it really briefly, or you talked about it really briefly, uh, but let's touch on Seer's death. How, how did you feel about that? Like, did it feel earned, for lack of a better term, for you? Again, for me, yes, because I I I invested so much in these games and in these characters, and you know it felt uh, you know Cal's lost another master, another friend, another connection, so it felt vital for his story. He's now on his own. He's facing the galaxy, the Empire, and himself alone. And you know, speaking of somebody who loves Seer, again, I, you know, I'm sitting here with the with her lightsaber there. You know, I love the character of Seer, but you know, I think her story. Her natural story ended here. You could have had her going into the next game, and who doesn't want to hear Deborah Wilson as Seer? I do. But it came to a, a breathtakingly good conclusion in this game. What you know? What else do you do with the character? It, 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 it comes down to, do I want more of the character? Absolutely. But what more can you do without it feeling like a stretch? That's what I feel like. With Seer, she's so powerful. How 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 long do you want her running around in the galaxy for, before it also starts to impede on the wider Star Wars story? There is those constraints, but I do think it was earned. I think it felt like a, I've, I've used this phrase a lot in this show, but it felt like a natural progression from Fallen Order. At the end of Fallen Order, she gives into fear with Vader almost. She gives into the dark side, and she is she can't beat him. She knows she can't beat him, and it's only Cal smashing the window on the base to let the ocean in that stops him here. She, she says it. I've let go of my fear. She's not scared of this guy anymore. And she absolutely whoops him. And well, she gives as good as she gets. I'll say that because at the same time, she's one of the only Jedi masters surviving out there. And she's not a punk. If I know lots of people say she shouldn't be able to stand up to Vader, but you know, she's a Jedi master. She's got all of her limbs. Vader hasn't. She can, you know, she, she isn't scared of him. A lot of the other people who face Vader, are frightened of him and that's why they lose she's not and yet, yet ultimately she she doesn't make it out of it and anyone i think most people who who went into that fight we all knew what was going to happen we, we we know she's not getting out of this but how was it going to go down so i think it was earned i think it was really well done i think the aftermath was excellently handled the problem i find with a lot of media including star wars sometimes is you'll have a big moment like a like a shattering moment but it's not dwell. They don't. Nobody dwells upon it, or they move on too quickly. I don't feel like they did here. They gave Sears' death the proper send off with the characters afterwards mourning, and then it actually continued to permeate through the story up until the very end. Sears' presence is there, and she feels like the Obi Wan of the story, intentionally or not. I think it is. But no, I do think that her death was earned, especially again. Prior to that, she finally said to Cal, yeah, I'll come with you to Tanalor. Because she didn't want to join the fight. But now she's like, do you know what? This is Tanalor's a way out for all of our families. I will join you. Everything, Everyone's happy. They're drinking tea. They're joking, Austin. Bode's joining in the jokes. And then it ain't going to last. And it's still, all hell breaks loose. I think it was excellent. And again, I haven't given enough credit. I've got the soundtrack down there on vinyl. But Gordy Harb and Stephen Barton's soundtrack score, sorry, is insane in this and the way the music hits in throughout the fight and in her death oh, chef's kiss I, I i i think it's really well done now i'm very interested now for you to say you hated it or something no it, it worked <laughs> it, it worked um like I, I um i don't have much more to add um other than i 
I, I didn't hate it. I loved it. Um, I and I, I know we didn't talk about soundtrack, but yeah, it just works here. I think it was one of the score moments where I'm like, okay, if this doesn't win at the game, what are we doing? And it, it won the Grammys. But, oh, it did win the Grammys. I, oh, I remember it won... that. Best, I don't know. It's a big old long title, but basically, it won best video games or multimedia score at the Grammy. So, Grammy oh, award winning soundtrack. Good, good, because it is a great soundtrack. Um, but yeah, Sears' death was very earned. As as soon as I saw her on Jetta, uh, with the archives, I'm like, okay, I know she's not making out of it out of this because if the Jedi had the archives, I feel like they'd be more uh well versed when it comes to like. Uh, like you would have had to have something in this game to be like, hey, Luke Skywalker, here's the Jedi archives. Yep. Um, like I, I feel like the sequel trilogy doesn't work if the Je Jedi archives are existing. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, it, it's up felt super earned. We get a great outro with her. Oh, it was one of the best moments of the game for me. You know, you get to control Seer for the first time. And um oh. and you're just like you've got um I think ATSTs coming in the area, which you, you had already been like you see them in the overworld of the game. Um, but now you get to just absolutely wreak havoc on them. Or I'm sorry, is it ATATs that you see in the overworld? Is that the chicken walker ones? It is ATST, no, you're right, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um because you see the chicken walkers in, in the overworld, mm -hmm. but you never see like the big honker elf ones. Um, well, you take those out with the big giant stone balls, don't you? You roll them down yeah. the hill and take those out. Which took me longer to realize that's what I had to do. <laughs> yeah. um, I just thought I'd like throw my lightsaber and just like go like do a force unleashed <laughs> um, kind of like move where you're like Ripping mashing X. Yeah. Where you're like taking the head and impaling it or something, or, or taking the leg off and impaling. Um, but, um, and in fact, it felt very uh, much like Force Unleashed, specifically Force Unleashed 2, um, in that aspect, where you're just like, okay, let, let us give you the ultimate power fantasy yeah. before Seer goes out like a champ. Um, and it sets her right, it sets her power level as well for when. I, I always allude to this because I've seen so many people saying, and I say it again, Vader should have wiped the floor. You know, there's too much fanboyism about Vader. Vader should have wiped the floor with her. It's not, that's not how it works. And also we've just played with Seer for that amount of time. And we've just seen her, like you said, dude, taking out at ats taking out ATSTs, helping to take out waves of stormtroopers and purge troopers. To say then that that person should be, you know, beaten like that is crazy she they they set her power level up. so when you fight vader it isn't as much of a surprise that you can go toe to toe with you know the dark lord of the sith himself yeah yeah i i totally agree i i didn't have a problem with her almost defeating vader i do have a little problem though a little problem that causes problems with lore at this point you know, we already know that force healing is a thing. <laughs> Come on. You're, you're meaning to tell me that um, a Sabine can st uh, get stabbed through the abdomen and survive and Seer can't? I I don't know about that's that. That's something I've chalked up to that. I think to me that that's a, that's a Dave Filoni issue. Okay. Because it really only happens in things that Dave's attached to. Because people said about the Acolyte. Well, hold on. One of these characters gets a knife thrown at them and dies. Oh, well, yeah, that's what would happen. The acolyte is doing it right. Like Jedi Survivor is doing it correctly. If you get a lightsaber through the gut, game over. You know, that is it. It's, so I think the inconsistencies come from other places I look at. That's where I see it from. But um, and also in terms of like the force, I, I just look at it like, well, some people can do this. Some people can do that. Like Cal can use psychometry and sense what happened to see and you know luke skywalker uh, he can't do that but then again he wasn't trained but then ray can do this that you know cal can't do i think it's quite cool that they almost have their own individual 
like move sets almost like mm-hmm. you can do that and you can do that and you can do that i think it's cool but you know i think the like the force or, or sorry the ability to withstand a lightsaber is more of a and i love dave filoni but it is more of a dave filoni issue where yeah, if you get stabbed, you got to, that's game over. Like Qui-Gon, he, Qui-Gon didn't come back in the Phantom Menace, so nobody else should. I'm but... still sore about that. I'm still so sore. Like, Qui-Gon was great. Like, it is. 20 plus years later, I'm still like, if I was Qui-Gon, I'd be like, you guys knew? You guys knew how to do <laughs> this and you didn't well, even try? Me. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, and I know they pass it off, and I have as well in conversations that with Sabine, they they make a concerted effort to show that it missed her gut, but it's a like it's a lightsaber which is burning through you at the I don't even know what temperature that thing is going through at. You aren't surviving it, and you know I, I credit the acolyte and Jedi survivor and things like that for making lightsabers, not to use a phrase associated with anybody else, but making lightsabers lethal again. You know, make making them feel like a legitimate game over weapon once that thing's drawn <laughs> you either survive or run yeah. or you'll die so yeah so. yeah and um going back into characters let's talk about calamar and how do you what do you think about that like they finally get together in this game um i i hate to use the same question but well not does it feel earned but um how do you think it felt like finally fulfilling that th- that promise from Fallen Order where it very much is like she's flirting with him but doesn't know it and Cal's like, I don't know what to do. I've never been around a girl. Exactly. Um, uh, what did you think about that relationship? Yeah, it's a fist bump moment for me when it finally happened. And, and a lot of it comes down to context as well. Like the moment in which they finally kiss... It's after they've tried to save the the brother Armias, the the um, I can't think of what the anchorite, whatever he's called, from you know being crushed. They're trying to save the hidden path and the secrets and basically save that organization. He gets killed, and then they've got to rush out. And how are they going to get out of this? Because that massive drill's there, and well, and it's the franticness and the excitement of it. And then you get that, and I'm like, yeah, that feels right. And the classic Star Wars line of you know. You know, what was what was that for? And she's like, it was for. Oh no, was that for luck? No, it was for me. Mm. I think it's very earned because of the ball and order dynamic. And again, in Survivor, they have the moment where you meet Mary, and she's the one you're there to meet. They have their discussion about, you know, what she went away for, what she found, um, and cat, and they have the discussion in the cave as well. Which is excellently shot mm-hmm. about letting the fire consume you and essentially just being finding yourself in all of this chaos of which she has done. And you can see in Cow's eyes, he's like, Man, she, she I've been fighting this stupid fight and you know, Merrin's gone off and she's found herself and she's at such a different place now. Where she and Seer, they're fighting the Empire, but in such a bigger way than Cal ever did. They're helping people. Cal isn't. So when you get to their relationship, it is a fist bump moment. And when Cal's like, I know what I want now. I know what I should be focusing on. And they have another kiss in uh, the night before everything goes to hell and back. Mm. It feels so right. And mm, it's another thing. It's uh, We're going to touch upon it throughout. But I just hope they follow it up in that third game. Uh, you know, we'll, whether we, I, I guess we'll touch on the third game later, but I just hope mm. they follow up on that because it felt right. It felt good. And a Jedi and a Knight sister, you know, they don't travel well. They're survivors. And it's not your standard pairing. It isn't Jedi and Jedi. There are conflicts there, which are, again, I hope that I, I hope they explore, you know, they, their outlook on life is different. Their outlook on the force is different. They force each other to look at things with a different perspective, which is something which I wish Star Wars did more in live action. You know, let's push the boundary of it. I loved it. Oh, I was so excited. I was when when they finally kissed. I finally, finally, man. Yeah. If there was ever like an option to create a technology to fist bump a character through the screen, I would have like, <laughs> hey, Cal, good job. Yeah. 
We're all your wingman here. We're all nudging you. Just come on, man. And the same for you, Marion, as well. You know, just be honest with each other. And yeah. they finally were. He got his goth baddie. He uh, he absolutely did. And, you know, she she got a adventurous, fearless hunk as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it worked for me um a lot. It it it, it there was not a beat where I was like, oh, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, yeah, I'll just echo what you said uh, there. And I think it works really well when um, you get a certain power late in the game, or I, I think mid, or as soon as you meet her, actually, uh, in Jedi Survivor, you get the little teleport ability from her. Um, oh, yeah. And that was another case where I'm like, oh, this is a current gen game, because you would not be able to do that on a hard drive. Well, or maybe yeah. now you can, because it's on Xbox One, so that sequence where you have to go through the portals was insane yeah and i'm gonna have a fan theory for a minute okay i think they did more than kiss i think there's a jedi <laughs> baby there's one more jedi survivor i uh, i i hope so but then they've got cotton now as well at the end of the game i'm like do they want another kid on top of that because i listen i'm a father and i always said Oh, I'd love to have a couple of kids, and I have one, and she's the love of my life. But now I'm like, damn, I don't know if I can have what one's enough. So, uh, I wonder what Cal and Marin are thinking if they're like, do you know what, Carter? She doesn't, she doesn't make her bed, she doesn't tidy her room in the Mantis. I don't really think I can do that again. But I'm, I, I kind of with you there, dude. If if it isn't in this game, I do think I don't want to say I think, but part of me is like, oh, I wonder if they're gonna do that. Because Cal's already given up the order now in terms of attachment and all that. I wonder if they're going to go full, go full hog on this. They're not yeah. going to show it, but I wonder if they're going to <laughs> imply it, yeah. Yeah, they're not going to do a first person like you're looking up in VR. Uh, no. Uh, that's a Star Wars Jedi VR. Uh, <laughs> that's DLC. Uh, that's the EA Play season pass. Um, but no, uh, I'd be fine either way, but I was just like, oh, fade to black. I know what's happening there. Yeah. But um, especially after you just saved some, saved her life. And the way Bode looks at him when he walks walks off, he's like, I'm going to go and record a story. And he kind of winks and nods. He's like, <laughs> like yeah. come on, Bode, man. And, I, and that's the day. And with Bode, I'm like, man, I get that he's apprehensive about going to Tanalore with a hidden path, but... Just moments like that, even then the last time you really speak to him pre his betrayal, he's kind of like, listen, I'm going to go and do this. You, you have a good night. You've earned it, brother. And I'm like, this guy, this is, this guy's cool. This is a great dude. Yeah. And then he goes and does what he does, man. You get the high of the family being back together, drinking tea. They're all teasing each other. Marin and Cal, were they at least kiss now how much further they went. Bode's being cool. Why did you have to do it, Bode? Why? Why? Why did you have to do it, man? Yeah, I, I echo that Kylo Ren meme of the uh, of him screaming traitor. Yes, like yes, dude. Did did, did you when? Because when you're okay, we, we've spoken about the bow betrayal and that, and where mm -hmm. it comes in the game. But of course, before that, and you have the whole Dagon stuff, and I'd love to know your thoughts on him as a character. Sure. Yeah. But Dagon was set up as the primary antagonist. I want to say sixty well, percent of the game, maybe sixty percent through the game, you ki he's you kill him, he's dead. Mm -hmm. But the game's not done there. When you kill Dagon, did you think that was game over? No, I'm like, well, no. he's got like, I I can't remember. Have you killed all the like his minions yet? I can't remember. No, you uh, haven't. He's the first baddie you kill. Yeah. Okay. So main baddie. Yeah. Yeah. Like I I didn't think it was game over, but. I was just like, okay, where's the story going? And then, like, the hint is given that, like, oh, you should go off and be with Mare. And I'm like, uh, Bode, what are you saying? Um, you, this is this is real traitor behavior right now. Um, Ooh. but yeah, no, oh no, you um defeat um Dagon and then right jump right into Bode, I think. A few yeah, hours so you later, de you defeat Dagon, and then Bo's like, "Oh, look, I'm going to hang around here for a bit," which went straight over my head the first time. Yeah, yeah. Then you then you go back to Jeddah. Exactly right. He steals the lightsaber, 
And then you go back to Jeddah and Cordova says, you know, I'll, I'll fix the, the compass. You guys go and have a great time. And of course, and then they do. Uh, and it's, it's celebratory. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's ecstatic. You know, you, you you're going to Tanel or you're going to be safe. And right. I, I didn't. Oh man, I'd love to know. Yeah, what? So your thoughts on that? What did you think about Dagon as well as uh, an overall antagonist? Yeah, sure. I think Dagon was a pretty weak antagonist. I I didn't really feel like, and maybe this is where my criticisms of having the companion book start to come in. Mm -hmm. Um. It, it it really felt like okay, there's something I'm missing here. And we know that he's tied to the old, uh, not the old Republic, the High Republic. Uh, he's been like in stasis for what, like a thousand years or something like that. Two hundred years. Two hundred years. Sorry, yeah, a um, long time still. I, I always get fuzzy on like High Republic timeline because it's so new. Um, because it's basically just in books and in the acolyte. That's basically mm -hmm. all we have. Uh, this is the first time a game's really interacted with that lore, uh, and I don't know anything about the High Republic. So I'm like, outside of Acolyte and this. So I'm like, okay. Um, I need some blanks filled in on like why he's so um, important to the story. Why like, it, it, it was just weird to me. I didn't get his motivations as a antagonist. He, he literally just wakes up and starts yapping for lack of a better term, <laughs> bleeds this crystal and says, bye, and um, has the one guy be rearrangeable guts. Uh, uh, Ravis. Ravis. Uh, pick him up. He called the Ravis Uber. Uh, <laughs> Ravis Space Uber. Uh, and I was just like, okay. That was the first point where I'm like, what is this game going to be about? Like, if, da da if I bodied Dagon in the first fight like what why What's is he next? even like the main guy so I think that's where you know I was talking about like recognizing Bode as the antagonist early this is where my brain went into overdrive I know I've said mm -hmm. it on other podcasts before but uh, Arrival in Annihilation you know got, got the poster there I'm like um, those movies my when something doesn't click for me my brain goes into overdrive trying to fit the missing puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. So any interactions with any characters, I was immediately on like high alert. I'm like, what's going on? Like, because Dagon definitely isn't the antagonist we think it is. Is it Z uh, five or whatever her her name is? Um, like, who is actually the real uh, antagonist? Is it Ravis in the background, of, like he, some secret Sith or something? Uh, because Bravis has been alive for 200, 300 years. Uh, he's like one of the, you read his da uh, data little bio thing, and it says he's been alive for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Like his species can live very, very long. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. he can live very long. He might be the actual villain. Um, and then that turns out not to be true. And then, you know, obviously we get the Bode reveal. And when Bode starts talking about, like, maybe you should be with Marin. Maybe you could just settle down and not be a Jedi. It's like, what mm. are we doing here, Bogue? Um, and there's like certain animations where after you talk to him, you could catch him around the overworld, like looking at things that he's not supposed to be looking at. And it's like, okay. So I put in the t I put on my uh, Sherlock Holmes hat. So overall, um, Dag and Gera just really didn't work for me because I. Because one, the High Republic has never come into any part of Fallen Order or any other part of Cal's story. It didn't make sense to me. Um, like if it was maybe somebody who worked for Count Dooku, I'd maybe understand. Or, you know, um, because like the first shot we get, and it's on the main menu, um, is of the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, okay, the Jedi Temple has to be important somehow. So I, my my brain was working overdrive, and I'm like, obviously Dagon isn't Dagon isn't the villain, something. It just didn't work. There's no personal connection, and then, you know, the personal connection happens with Bode. So it's like, oh, mm -hmm. 
yeah, he didn't work for me. None of the High Republic stuff worked for me. Um, that just didn't work. Um, I like the robot though. So he's cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it doesn't work. In terms of the High Republic law, the one thing I can say, whether whether it puts your mind at ease or not, is you don't need to. Because I've read the books and most of the comics, there's quite a lot to uh, to engage with. I usually just read the books, so is that you know none of what happens in survivor is you don't need to read the books to know anything about it it's not it doesn't play off of anything it doesn't jump off of anything of anything hmm. when dagon goes into the the uh the back to tank that is right at the beginning of the high republic so that would also explain why he's never been in any of the books he's in the back to tank the whole time which i quite like as well but and the the, the nods to the high republic for someone who's read the books and that they're very cool but they're not dependent on Similarly to the Acolyte, you don't need to read the books to know anything about the era when you watch the Acolyte. There are mentions of things that happen in the books, which I'm always going to be grateful for because it, it's rewarding you for your time spent. But nothing in Survivor is uh, hangs its hat on the fact that you need to know what happens. If anything, it's more of an introduction to the era. Uh, and it's kind of like, well, this is what happened a couple of hundred years ago. It, to me, it's more like, that's what happened if you want to find out more, go and read these 12 books, go and buy these 20 comics. It's like, it's very much trying to merchandise off of it. But yeah, the whole thing did feel like a, a bit of a left field swing out of nowhere. And I do think it is a conscious effort to try and push the new era. They know they've got the higher pub, and you know, for better or worse, they did it. I like the character of Dagon. Dagon. I agree. I think they could have fleshed out, or I think they could have explained his motivations better. Or it certainly spent more time explaining them. I don't need everything spelled out to me, but I do need to get a sense of what exactly he wants to do other than go to Tanalor, raise an army and attack, take over the galaxy, which seems like a bit of a stretch from where he was when he went in the tank. Uh, so I I do think they could have spent a bit more time with him. I liked him as a antagonist in the fact that he was, you know, doing really funky stuff with the jet, with the force. He was, manipulating the force with his emotions and uh you know changing the fight to be what he wanted it to be so the bit where it you know you're, you're on the ceiling on the floor it's crazy and, and he multiple... the arm. i did like that i thought that was very cool even though yeah. I was, when i watched a, a cinematic it today and they're locked fight they're locked with their bla sabers and then suddenly the second hand comes out of nowhere i did th and this is me again being a critic and being like yeah, you know, he didn't need to do that. He could have just cut him in half, yeah. and he wouldn't. And he'd, he'd been like, he didn't even have to tell him that. But similarly to how they did in the acolyte, when I actually won't spoil that. But yeah, I, I like the character. You know, visually, very cool. I like his fighting style. But I do think that out of all the eight, out of all the antagonists, he was the one that they could have done with a little bit more meat on the bone of Ravis. Ravis, I got enough of him. I think he was cool. You know, he's he's a warrior. He has a code of honor. He has a you know, that is, he has a warrior's code. He he's living in a galaxy now where he doesn't think there's any honor. The empire is not honorable. He can't, he wants to be free of his servitude to Dagon, and he's only in servitude to him because Dagon beat him in a fight a couple hundred years ago. That's you know, and 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 because of that, he owes a debt of gratitude to Dagon. That's why that, you know, I'm I'm fine with that. I don't need to know any more about that. He doesn't want to take over the galaxy. He doesn't want to be a moustache twirling villain he's just following Dagon's orders and actually if he gets a Tanner law he's even said once we if we get there you know I consider my oath fulfilled you know I'm done mm -hmm. uh, and it's Dagon who's like no you're not so you know I like Ravis I think he had a you know I like the fact that they gave him a, a, a code of honour so he wasn't just a big mindless idiot trying to kill you they could have had him as that and it would have been cool but you know I, and I also like the way he goes out as well you know give me my warrior's death mm -hmm. I'm not going to help you but I'm not going to stop you getting to where you need to go to. You know, I, I quite liked that. I liked that so we didn't recruit him as part of the gang because that would have felt like we're in a shark. And I, and I think Respawn have got a handle on this kind of stuff. You know, they know that what people would ex will accept. And if suddenly Ravis is like, okay, I will work for you now. I'll, Cal, I will join you. I think people would have just thought, no, that, that, that wouldn't work. Whereas Ravis saying, Haha, nope, I'm not going to join you, Jedi. But, you know, I'll tell you, you know, Dagon's going here. I've done this, this and this. But, you you know, you're going to have to kill me now because that's what I want. 
you know, kill or be killed. So I, you know, I like that. So I like Ravis. I like Dagon. I like Bode as an antagonist as well. You, you could also say the same about him. Is are his motivations strong enough? But he's a father, and he says that you know, I'm a father. I just want to keep my kids safe. And he says it a few times. Can you hold the empire back? Can you keep my daughter safe if the empire come knocking? He knows Cal can't. Does that then mean he was right to basically condemn everyone in the hidden path to death by saying, I don't want, you're not coming to Tanalor. You could stay and be refugees and f fight the empire. Me and my kid, we're having this whole planet to ourselves. No. So I can kind of understand his motivation to an extent. You know, you want to do anything to keep your family safe. But at the expense of thousands of pe hundreds of thousands of people, maybe mm -hmm. that ain't a good move, Bode. So, you know, there was nothing stopping Bode going to Tanalor with Cal and basically sitting down and saying, right, let's let's work this out. Let's make this foolproof. Let's work out a, a, a schedule where, you know, I'll go out or we'll go out and do do this at this time. We'll get these people and we'll make sure he could have done that. But, you know, he, he obviously he'd gone down a dark path. He was he'd lost himself and fine. But yeah, I think Dagon was the one that could have done with a little bit more topping on that pizza. Yeah, I, I even feel like some kind of uh, playable prologue where we play as Dagon. Mm. Where, we you know, that first scene where um, we're looking through Dagon's eyes and Cal's like confused. How am I, how am I here? What What's going on with that? I think that could have been the nice intro to the game. Instead of, I know Cal can do the psycho... Not psychogrammetry. Um, <laughs> Psychometry. Psychometry. Stuff where he can see into people's minds and, you know, relive the memories. But, like, that just didn't work for me because mm -hmm. it's like, okay, you're gonna, you're not even connected to his head. Like, are you, like, the back to tank has those memories? What? What? Um, how does the back to tank have those memories? Anyways, but. The force, that's why. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the reason. Because we need it to happen. That's the reason. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think a prologue of that could easily have fulfilled that same thing because you're kind of throughout the game going through learning his uh, motivations and looking at it and you're like, but there's like a an additional, I'm going to use a metaphor here. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows who's read my reviews knows I love using a metaphor. It would be like, Okay, you've got the bun of the burger, you've got the meat, you've got the lettuce, you've got the tomato. Oh, but wait, you forgot to buy, say, the cheese. Or the top bun's missing. That's what Dagon's um that's what Dagon's motivations felt like. There was just that cheese or that bun missing from the, my uh the final piece of the puzzle, as I said earlier. Was just missing. I can um, see that, yeah. And, you know, you brought up something, or you made me think of something while you're talking about Dagon. Um, or, or rather, in terms of Star Wars lore kind of things. Did it feel weird to you that we're mixing three different eras of Star Wars lore at the same time? Like, there's prequel stuff that's going on. There's sequel stuff that's being pulled from. There's High Republic stuff that's being pulled from. And then there's um, 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 the little robots from episode three. The Droidicus. Yes. I know what you mean. Yes and no. I do because... Again, as a fan of the franchise, I've seen that they've done this a few times in different media where they're like, well, because if you think about it, the Clone Wars would have only been, would have ended, I think, uh, about nine years prior, maybe 10 years before. So it stands to reason that there probably would be a droid or two hanging about. Uh, it's not like it was 50 to 100 years later where, you know, you'd think they'd be gone. You know, the idea of the Bedlam Raiders, who are the the the, the gang on Kobo, having an entire droid army is okay, fine. I can get, I guess, but they explain it because they've got that huge separatist ship. They have to invade. That's why they're there. So, you know, they, they, 
they make sure to cover their tracks as to why the high republic thing you know you could look at it and think well Pyloon saloon you know grease's pub grease's cantina just happened to be built on top of a high republic so okay right I, I love the story so i'll kind of gloss over the fact that that was one of those story moments that just had to happen um but that brought in the high republic and i do think a lot of that was also just to introduce that era to a wider audience uh and the the, the sequel stuff like you say i think as well i think they're just trying to tie in as much as they can do to make everything feel legit to make everything feel like one um story like there was there's been uses of stuff from fallen order in other things especially the obi-wan kenobi show which was great to see and it legitimizes the game even though it's part of the canon mm -hmm. it just legitimizes it more and if you haven't played the game and you watch kenobi you're not missing <clears throat> excuse me you're not missing anything but if you have played the game it adds more to it and i guess that's what they're going for as well like if you've read the high republic books you'll you'll notice some of the things they say and be like oh i've it's the leo dicaprio meme yeah pointing at the screen i i understood that reference or maybe the captain america one but can it feel a little bit ott in this game yes it does as a fan of the franchise i love being able to fight battle droids and things like that but then i compare it to the almost kind of stripped back nature of fallen order where you, you don't have that you're just fighting the empire and you know, I, you know, there is something to be said about that simplicity of the first game being, you know, there's a certain charm to that. But if if you just did that again for the second game, what's the point? So I, I get why they had to go bigger. Did they make? Did did they try too much? I think the argument could be made for that. Again, as somebody who loves the game so much, I I I, I will ha I'll eat all of it up. But the argument can be made that was there too much going on? You know, were there too many antagonists? Were, was it was there enough time to give everyone? space to develop did we need to have all of these disparate factions going on from different eras you know i think your mileage will depend on that for me i got i got over it i i, I didn't mind it but i'm not blind to the fact that i think you know they really were ambitious with this game which does make me question not in a negative way but it does make me question what what do we do next where the hell do we go now mm -hmm. if we've had two fights with vader well we haven't well, so we've had one. I know we've had we were. We so said the first fight in Fallen wasn't a fight with Cal. There wasn't even a health bar. So we fought Vader twice. We've 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 lost two of our masters. We've we fought the Empire. We fought the Bedlam Raiders and a High Republic Jedi. Where where what is next? You know what I mean? That's kind of where I'm thinking is what is the motivation? Because we know there's another game coming. It's in development. Do you think the next game will be the last game? In this I think, series, I, I think it will. Um, but I do wonder if that will be the next time we see Cal. Mm -hmm. Because I know I, I was one of the people who bought into the rumors about Obi Wan Kenobi and maybe Cal mm -hmm. appearing in that show. I still think that's going to happen. I think yeah. it's going to happen in Mandalorian and Grogu. Um, where it's like a much, much older cow. Um, like, I don't know. He, he's doing something. I don't know. Maybe like Grogu's just like, hey, making ba baby Yoda noises. And it, and then like Cal's off drinking in the background. I don't know. I, I need to see Cal in live action. I need to, I just need to see it. You don't get Cameron Monaghan and then not use him in live action. But I do think the third game is the last game. And it was funny, uh, before you asked that question about uh, if it's the last game, you know, you were talking about losing two of his masters. I have a terrible thought. Mm -hmm. What if Cal loses Marin in the third game? I think in the third game, and I love Greasy Money, baby. I love Grease. Grease is one of my favorite characters in Star Wars. It's because he's just a curmudgeonly old man with a heart of gold he's that classic archetype character but and danny roebuck who i've interviewed and he's a great guy he uh he brings so much to that character but i think i think greasy money's time is up in the next game yeah i think grease will be the one to bite it uh, and that is why and i think because of that we will then be given the opportunity to like, that's where the mechanic of flying the mantis will come in to get from a to b we have to fly it um Marin, though this is this is the million dollar question is 
what what do they do? How far do they want to go? Because Cal has lost everything, everything. So do we want to have it where he loses his own life at the end of the story? Because if he does, it will be a glorious sacrifice. There's no way Cal's going out like a punk. But but you know, do we have that glorious sacrifice? Do, do Cal and Mary and have the false babies like we say? Do they just wait it out on Tanalor? Because at the minute, that's one hell of a story out. The, the Empire don't know about it. You could just have Cal sit on that planet for 10 years, train up the next generation of Jedi, or just train Kalta, come back out to face the galaxy. And then he was like, wow, the Empire are gone. Now, the whole time I was on there, I didn't realise, and he's coming into a new galaxy. Um, yeah, it's. I, I do believe Cal's story is going to end in the next game. You know, I think they always said it's going to be a trilogy. I do think Cal's going to, he won't be making it out, but I don't know about Merrin. You know, it, 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 it depends on the story. You know, what, and that's what I said. Will the Empire find out about Tanalor or the Hidden Path again? Is Cal going to say, right, I, I need to take Vader out? I don't know. All I wanted to do is retain that personal feeling, its uniqueness, and let the characters that respawn and developed be the ones to bring this baby home i don't because i don't need cameos i'm not interested unless they work like i know we're in spoilers now so you know how boba fett turned up now that's great little cool little moment where boba fett turns up vader's presence felt necessary in in these games but i don't need to see cal just happened happening to fall upon obi-wan in the desert i don't need to see him accidentally find yoda the one thing i would say about the sequels and i i, I do like those films in you know rise of sky it is what it is but fine what i wish they'd done is i wish they'd had the courage to end it with their own characters the last jedi ends up with uh luke's gone snoke is gone kylo and ray are all that's left i wish episode nine had just been kylo versus ray in this big emotional film full of character depth and nuance Instead, you know, they revert it back to we've got to bring Palpatine back and we've got to have this, this and this. But they didn't have the trust in their own characters. I need Respawn to have trust in their characters that it isn't Ahsoka coming in or Ezra Bridger and Kane and they're not the ones who come in and save the day. No, it's Cal, it's Merrin, it's Grease and Catter in this case. Well, they're the ones who bring this home, whether they win or not. That's all I care about. It's Merrin getting out, though. I don't know. I I don't know. It depends what happens with Carter. Do they want to leave Carter an orphan? Basically, is the question here because I can see a situation where Malin, M Merrin and Cal, sorry, have a glory. It's a bit like the end of Bonnie and Clyde or something, or uh, where they they. I just hope Cal and Merrin get to go out on their own. Maybe they'll go out in a blaze of glory. Maybe it'll be like Bonnie and Clyde or Thelma and Louise, where they go out together. But then, like we said. Carter, they're not going to orphan off Carter. In short, mate, I, I, I don't know. I think Cal's not... I think Merrin might be the only survivor of this story. Whether people like that or not, I don't know. It it depends whether they want to have Cal around post-Return of the Jedi and another Jedi surviving and stuff like that. I don't want that to happen because I want Cal's story to be wrapped up in the games. Because mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. Cause so many people want to see Cameron Monaghan in live... And so do I. But I mentioned recently that I'd love, I want them to finish the game. I want Jedi 3 to come out. I think it'll be called Jedi Legacy. I think that's what it's going to be called. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got Fallen Order, Survivor Legacy. That's just what I think. I want that to come out, tell Cal's story, and then you can go back and put him in something else. Like You can have him show up in Kenobi, and we know where his story goes, but it doesn't impede on the game, what the story's telling. Because Cameron Monaghan is fiercely protective of his character hearing interviews of him he is fiercely protective so he will only do what he thinks he'll only appear if it's right for the character and i respect that uh, as well he wants the character to go out or to be portrayed in a way that he feels does justice to what he's done so we'll see but i think grease is going which pains me to say I, 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 i'm going to be a blubbering wreck if grease dies but i think Cal's going to go Mirren, i'm not sure about you 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 posed the question. Yeah, who's making it out of the game three? So I I agree. Grease isn't making it. Um, no. he he already lost an arm in between games. Um, which is 
is explained in the Battle Scars book. Yeah. Um, I think the uh, people who came for him in the first game end up killing him. Oh, the brood, Haxian brood. Yeah, the Haxian brood, because they're still around in the sequel trilogy. So that that means they're forced to be reckoned with. So I don't think you can just easily get away get away from them. Um, I think Kata gets away. Um, scot free. Um, I think we do have a prologue where we see her grown up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Marin makes it. Um, by the skin of her teeth. Uh, like little, not well, not literally. I don't think you can show like somebody's skin falling off in a game. But um, <laughs> well, I mean, you've got Mortal Kombat, but. Um, they did it with Palpatine in the Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, so um, I think she makes it only to serve Ahsoka. Like that, what happens there? Because I feel like she. I mean, they're very clear about um, Marin's status as like the last Night Sister. So how is it that there are three Night Sisters and uh, and Setos? Uh, somebody had to have done something. Um, um, Cal, I don't think he makes it. I don't think he makes it. I don't think anyone, uh, I think Cal's the only one who dies. Um, because I think there will be a switch that flips inside of him, uh, with the antagonist of the third game. And Mm -hmm. that'll be what. I don't think we get a third Vader fight. I think I don't think that happens. Um, yeah. Or if we do, it'll be so gloriously epic that those questions about like how can Cal defeat Vader or something yeah. like that will just be amplified to a thousand yeah. degrees. It would you know, have to be epic just to. Yeah, Warren is inclusion. Look, Vader needs to. Vader is a Jedi hunter, and he's the daddy. But they have the Inquisitors, of course. But you've had Vader in both of these games. My, my, obviously, the fear is if you put him in a third game, it almost becomes kind of like, oh, again. So it'd have to be one hell of a fight. And I do think the Death Star at least makes an appearance in the third game. I think Tantalor gets blown up. Can you imagine with people on it? With people on it. You beast. With maybe... I, I could see either Grease or Cal being on it well. Um, and maybe that's the moment where we fly away, like you've been talking about all uh, podcasts. We have to fly away, leave Grease behind, or something like that. Don't say that. I can't <laughs> handle that. I can't handle that. Or do this worse. Uh, we have to leave Marin behind. Ooh. The cow. See, I don't. I don't think cow could do that. I, no, I don't think he could. But like, I, but but to save Carter, would he? Yeah. Um, oh damn. And but yeah, I think somebody gets gets the business end of a star. Uh, it, the Death Star laser. Something big's gonna happen. Something big has to happen. Or do they go the other way and make it? a smaller game like Fallen Order where you just have one kind of primary anta- primary antagonist throughout and you you yourself are almost your own worst enemy. You're trying to fight the dark side. You're trying to do what's right to guide Kata through the darkness like Sia said. Do, do, they, do they pivot and give you a, a smaller story? It, well, I, think I say it smaller. Did... It's, it's going to be an epic story, but in terms of scope. I think it goes even bigger. Um, yeah. I think... You're going to be able to fly your own ship. Uh, maybe even the man. Oh, no. Maybe even the Mantis is the one that gets turbo lasered. Oh, I always have my model up there to remember it, boy. And, and the customization <laughs> extends now to your ship like it was mm-hmm. in the first game. Yeah. Because now you've got to switch out parts because some some parts of your ship break down mid-flight. You know, you fly hyperdrive too much. Yeah, maybe, maybe your home base now is going to be the Mantis or whatever ship you have, because in the at the beginning of the game, um, Tantalor gets blown up. 
or attacked at least yeah or attacked like f- some found out like you can't you have to get off Tantalor. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how they get so, something will happen I think in the first third of the game which is pretty big I mean I mean it's not that's not a hot take I think something massive will happen but it's what is it is it going to be one of our characters um kicking the bucket I think it will be I, I I'm just excited again I'm I'm even more anxious now because these two games I high I hold in high esteem I think they're fantastic examples of how to do Star Wars it's got all of the hallmarks of Star Wars, but it's pushing the envelope a bit more compared to what we've seen in live action. You know, everything Cal's going through, we're not, we're not seeing that in live action at the minute. You know, the 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 family dynamic, we're not seeing that in live action. The 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 expiration and the you distinctness of what they're showing, we're not seeing that in live action at the minute. It's kind of a bit. How, how do we make people happy? Well, let's show them what they know. You know, just, these games do that, but they also stand on their own two feet. Now, with the third game, man, am I, are they, I just hope they nail it. That's my only real fear is I just hope that they nail that the ending or the, the story of that game. Because if they do, for me, best one of the best Star Wars trilogies of all time, best Star Wars stories ever of all time, if they can get the landing. Yeah. You know, I just kind of came up with the perfect analogy, the perfect video okay. game analogy for what I think Jedi 3, the scope of it will be. And it's ambitious. So just mm-hmm. strap in. Uh, I think it'll be um, as big in scope as Starfield. Big then. Yeah, like big. Like, you know how you have Constellation, uh, that... Like you'll have a home base kind of like that. Maybe that's Tantalor or something like that. Um, and then you have to like upgrade your ship. You have to upgrade like your weapons. Um, or, or in this case, your lightsaber. Um, and maybe you get some customization for Kata. And uh, maybe she has like a trainer's lightsaber or something like that. I could see, I could definitely see like a point in the game where you play as Kata. Um, like the Last of Us, when you play as Ellie in the first one. Oh yeah, maybe maybe Cal dies, and then you have to play as Kata for the rest of the I've game. I've seen that, yeah. Or, or or at least he's taken out of the game for for some reason. Yeah, like like we like we've seen. You know, Cal Cal is Cal's beaten by Bode. Mm-hmm. Well, let's play as Seer. I, I I don't I, man, I don't know where it's going to go. But I, think- I like that. I think either way, we're going to be a blubbering mess when it comes out in, what, by three or four years from now? Yeah, I'd say 2027, I reckon. Because um, this game was this game was impacted by COVID. Obviously, Respawn mm-hmm. had to, as everything was, Respawn had to completely rework their way of working. And actually, Stig has now taken that into his new, um, new studio, the way that they work. So, uh, and this game was rushed out. They said that themselves. It actually took less development time than Fallen Order, which is understandable in it to to some extent that they've got the character models. They've got a lot of stuff. It's just obviously building new stuff. Do they learn? Hopefully, they learn from the rushed release of Survivor. But with Stig going, I think it's um, uh, I think it's Jason DeHeras is now the game director for Jedi Three, and he was the lead narrative designer for. Fall in order and survivor. So the guy replacing Stig has been there since day one. He's been in every meeting. He knows Stig Stig's story and he knows his brain. So I don't. I'm not too worried about the story feeling too like, like a completely big departure from the first two. A lot of the people who worked on the first two are still going to be working on this one. But how ambitious do they want to? That's it. How ambitious do they want to go? I think they'll do it. I think they'll stick the landing. But who knows if we'll agree with everything they do along the way. I just hope that they I hope that they trust their characters, they trust Cal and Merrin as well, to be the ones to finish the game. It's not oh and then hundreds of X Wings came in and saved you because oh, that's we need to set up Rogue One or something. No no no. I love connectivity. I love the connectivity, but let them finish their story. And 
I'm excited. I, I, I'm I'm sitting there now every day waiting for any bit of news to come out about the next game. But I also know that I'm going to be waiting a long time. Yeah, and I want, and um, you ha had me thinking about the time jump. You know, you asked about the time jump earlier. Mm -hmm. I think we will get a small time jump, um, maybe like two years, like you said. I don't think we're going to get another five year time yeah. jump because if we get five years, Kata's going to be way too old. And then it's going to be like, mm. I think, mm. sorry, uh, Kata's story is going to be the reverse of Cal's story. Um, where as he, you know, in Fallen Order, they talk about his story being from a very young age. He was like cutting himself off from the force and then had to grow up without the force. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll be the inverse for Kata, um, where she had to learn the force, assuming she does. I mean, probably she probably will, but uh, being with mm -hmm. mostly force users other than Grease. Yeah. Will um, she learn the Jedi way or will she learn the Night Sister way or a bit of both? I think she'll learn a bit of both. I think yeah. like the um um flash Jedi way where it's like, yeah, it's, yes, both light and good side. So uh, or I not light it. not light and good side, uh light and dark side. Where it's mm -hmm. like you can embrace your emotions but also know when to keep them in check. Uh, because if you don't, you end up like this person I fought in Jedi Fallen Order, or this person I fought in uh, Jedi Survivor. Obviously, Cal's not not going to say, "Hey, you remember Fallen Order?" No, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, and kind of going to look at him, and I'm like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you mean Fallen Order? What?" <laughs> but um, it's on but, sale quick. <laughs> the thirty dollars rush to PSN. <laughs> um, Actually, it's probably cheaper than that now. Um, it should be. Um, but either way, I can't wait till 2027. Uh, I, like, I would be fine uh, if the next Jedi game doesn't come out until um, the new generation of consoles. I'd be fine. Yeah, I can um, see it happening. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're already hearing about the PS6. Yeah. Um, uh, heard about it yesterday um, or at least I assume uh, that report was legit um, mm -hmm. it's way too early to know I think but I'd be fine with if they wait out the entire rest of the uh, thing and maybe we get more uh, Star Wars games that are like it like I, I would love to play Eclipse someday Quantic Dream if you're listening mm -hmm. please yeah um, because that like little alien dude that's banging their drum looks so cool. Like I want to hear about him. Like, and that's set in the High Republic as well. That game, yeah, or towards the end of I think so. And but yeah, like I'd love to uh, play that game. Um, if they resurrect a the Amy Henning game, where it's kind of like I, I forget the basis of that game, that game, but I'd love to play more Star Wars games. It feels kind of. I don't want to say barren, but also yes, barren. So, like before this, we got. I think the last game before this was what Squadrons or Outlaw? Not Outlaws. Um, Squadrons. Yeah, it was. Yeah, because yeah. EA had the exclusivity deal, didn't they? So it's only EA could make the games. And look, I I think controversy aside, with bad releases and loot boxes and things like that, I think EA's record is actually pretty good. Like Battlefront 2015 was great when it came out mm -hmm. 20 in 2017 with battlefront 2 fantastically fun game great story as well star wars squadrons i'm with you but it's a very niche game and mm -hmm. from people i know who like flight sim and space combat games they said it's it's really good it, you know it delivers on what it says it will do in terms of like that immersive experience and apparently it's great in vr i you know the game wasn't necessarily for me but those who like that have said it's good. Fallen Order was great and survived. So, I mean, the games they've given us have actually been very good if you look past the post and pre-release issues that they've had. Yeah. Whereas we've only had one now from another studio, and that's Ubisoft, which Outlaws is doing okay, but it isn't doing 
the same numbers that Battlefront has done or or the Jedi games. So it, yeah, it it was uh Outlaws was my counter pick for on my fantasy critic draft this year. Yeah, it's uh, it's the kind of game that I say get it if, if it when it gets in sale on sale, get it then. You know, it's it's definitely worth getting it on a discounted price, or if you can get it as part of some kind of game pass or whatever, do that. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. Ubisoft. I know you're not listening, but if you are, bring Ubisoft Plus to PS Plus. You already have the mm -hmm. Ubisoft Classic thing going on. Just and you've got Ubisoft Plus as part of I think Game Pass or like or something like that. You've got some where you can subscribe to Ubisoft Plus. I would love to play Assassin's Creed Shadows, but I'm not paying eighty dollars. Yeah, I'm yeah. or a hundred dollars or whatever it is. I would rather yeah. do the seven or however much it is a month for like one month yeah. to play all your games. So bring that to PlayStation, please. I, yeah. No, I, I would wouldn't love advocate anyone spending that money because that's a lot of money to anyone. So maybe the 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 discussion should be why are games so much money now? Why yeah. and yeah, you could argue that their next gen and more work goes into it, but on the flip side, not to sound harsh, but there aren't many games that are released AAA that actually are released in a complete fourth state. You know, not other than maybe Baldur's Gate, I think. Other than that, there aren't many games that drop on day one and are ready to go anymore. And I'm paying eighty pounds or a hundred bucks for a game. I want it. I want it ready on day one because I come from a generation where I'd buy a game. And it was ready to play. That was that was it. I I don't like the idea that people get you know studios get a pass because well we can patch it after a month or two or whatever. Well then okay, sell sell the base game for forty pounds. I'll pay forty pounds for a game which I know might be might have, might not be complete. And then you know maybe I'll pay twenty pounds down the line for when it's whatever for the patch. I don't know, but to pay eighty quid up top and it not work and to have what you experience, which is contemplating not even finishing after halfway or leaving it that's not value for money mm -hmm. and that's what i worry about so may, may, if the th when the third game comes out that's another thing is it is the value for money there i everything's fallen order and survivor have told me i'm going to say yes there will be but it comes down to the story dude if 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 they if they don't na nail the story then you know there's pressure on that's all I, that's it's that's what i was like there, there is a pressure on them now to to get this right yeah i mean first one was a new hope this one's empire yep bring it home with uh return of the jedi i that's believe it's exactly it. like that is exactly it but make it better than return of the jedi it's like <laughs> return of the jedi is goofy in some parts but um, don't say that to my Star Wars Sessions co-host it's his favourite Star Wars film because mm -hmm. it's far, because of the goofiness because of the wackiness yeah but uh, but uh, if they can deliver on like a Starfield-esque kind of thing but make it better than Starfield um, oh. you know don't don't procedurally generate the planets so that when no. I go to so that when I go to Earth it's not just like the skyscrapers and barren uh moon dust uh but yeah i think i think i'd love a, a jedi 3 with like you can fly anywhere or not fly anywhere but you get you're given a galaxy mm -hmm. to just explore tell. uh but yeah um we, and we've got some star wars shows coming up i know skeleton crew comes out what this month or next month um, fourth of December or for you guys over there in the states, third of December for us in the UK, the fourth. It's the day before my birthday. There you go, but early birthday present. You get two episodes of Skeleton Crew, which I think the trailers look like a lot of fun. And let me preface this: um, I love goofy Star Wars, so I don't care that there's a bunch of kids. <laughs> um, I just don't like goofy Star Wars when it's adults. Um, I, 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 I get it, yeah. It's like It Chapter 1 and It Chapter 2, if you like horror. Exactly, you know? yeah. Um, the first part is great. Looking forward to that. Maybe I'll have you on for a Skeleton Crew when that finishes up. Uh, and always up always up to talk Star Wars. Yeah, so, uh, but with that said... Okay, there we go. There's my notes. Um, 
for those listening or watching at home, I would love to hear what you think of Jedi Survivor. Um, you can talk to me on Blue Sky, Facebook, Instagram, threads, uh, under my username, Austin B Media. Yeah, I'll have a Discord channel uh, set up for this podcast. Um, and then I also have a Patreon community chat thingy um, that I'm still trying to figure out the merits of. <laughs> but um, speaking of Patreon, if you'd like early access to the next episode and much more, um, head over to patreon.com slash austinbmedia. For just three bucks a month, you get 48 hour early access to reviews, podcasts, interviews, articles, as well as the Patreon only channels of my Discord. And then if you go to the top of the tier, the 10 month month tier, uh, you'll unlock a, a po- uncut podcast episodes, bonus discussions, and exclusive retrospectives on films like Alien, Hellboy, Transformers, and more. But hey, I know subscribing isn't everybody's thing. So I've um, made it uh, available to um, purchase posts and collections on my Patreon shop. And then, hey, if you enjoyed the episode, uh, please consider subscribing on your favorite podcast app or to my YouTube channel. Uh, Leave a rating on your favorite podcast app. I know Pocket Cast just enabled that uh, um, ability just a few uh, updates ago. Uh, And then Spotify, uh, of course, and Apple Podcasts. And then review it. Um, Yeah, review it on can. Um, But uh, Matt, I want to thank you for joining me today uh where can people follow you uh and get your thoughts on movies games and more no no thank you for the opportunity always happy to talk star wars uh if you want to find me you can go to what i watch tonight.co.uk and just search for what i watch tonight across all of the socials i'm on letterboxd uh you can hear me every wednesday on star wars sessions talking about star wars every thursday on the bloody awesome movie podcast as well where i review a film Uh, with my buddy John and uh, regularly on Spook City, a horror movie podcast, uh, which is all about horror movies. That's that one's a little, a little bit more sporadic than the other two, but listen, I'm just happy to talk film. Uh, I love talking things other than star Wars, horror movies are what I was brought up on, but I'm happy to talk film with anyone at any time, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity to come on. Yeah. I'll make sure to ping you anytime I have star Wars or you've mentioned horror, or maybe we'll talk about saw later next year. But I've been your host, Austin Belser. And until next time.